London School of Economics. The second one took place in, in uh, the University of uh, Louvain. And this year it takes place at the Leiden University and we are hosting completely online. So we will have this morning and we also have tomorrow afternoon, two days uh, that we will be discussing um, the, the kind of the new topic, the topics of international taxation. And we are trying to do it from a different perspective. So we have a call for papers at the beginning of the year. And now we have now people who will be presenting their papers and we also have discussions. So thank you so much. I welcome everyone and I give the word to Eduardo who will give the introduction to the Global Tax Symposium. Uh, Eduardo? Thank you very much, Irma. Um, I would like to, to, to let you know what is fundamentally the mission what is of our Global Tax Symposium. The mission of our um, symposium is to be the, the first interdisciplinary mobile research platform on fundamental issues of international and comparative taxation. We are now covering all G20 countries and a number of non-G20 countries are that are part of our network. It is grounded on the belief that crossing African, American, Asia Pacific and European perspective is beneficial to all participants, especially in the current political and economic global context. It tends to offer young researchers and experienced scholars a forum in which to discuss five to six papers every year in different cities of all continents. Each paper is discussed by an interdisciplinary and intercontinental panel whose members are leading tax academics, tax practitioners, tax officials, and tax policy makers. Without uh, further ado, I am delighted to hand over to Miranda Stewart, who is the chair of our first panel. Miranda, over to you. Thank you, Eduardo, and greetings everybody from Melbourne, Australia, which is where I'm located. Um, and I'm really delighted to be chairing this first session. So uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to Irma for hosting this uh, version, this year's uh, Global Tax Symposium, and to Eduardo for his uh, extraordinary energy in building the network uh, of uh, countries and scholars around the world. We're really excited to have everybody here today. Um, and I believe it's being recorded. You, you would have received uh, a notice, I think, on Zoom about that. So we will be making it available. Uh, this is the time of year we usually have these events. Uh, and so we are planning, of course, for December next year. We haven't finally settled, but it's possible we'll be hosting that here in the Asia Pacific, probably making use of online technology, which is the way we are connecting everyone around the world. So let me go straight ahead. So our first uh, panel uh, is uh, the paper is being delivered by Professor Craig Elif from the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Uh, and the title of his paper is The Future of International Tax under the 2020s compromise. So it seems a very good place to start. Um, you would have received from, from the organizers uh, a, a link to, um, I believe, some of the papers. Um, and I think uh, there will also be some slides. The discussants uh, for this paper, uh, we have uh, Thomas Rickson from Freie University, the Universität Berlin in Germany, and Irma and Dirk uh, from Leiden University in the Netherlands. So uh, Craig, I'm gonna hand straight over to you. So Arisa, if you'd like to start sharing your slides, um, we have uh, 20 minutes for our paper and 10 minutes for each of our discussants and 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so if people do have Q&A while Craig's getting organized, um, you should feel free to put uh, questions in the chat and I will keep an eye on the chat uh, and come back to them. Um, there may be some time for raising hands of questions, but if you would like some questions asked uh, and have those sort of in the mix, put it in the chat and I will check on that. Uh, great. So over to you, Craig. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Miranda. And, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, to you all. Uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure um, to be speaking here. And I'd like to, to thank Irma and all the organising committee um, for all the hard work uh, that has gone into this. It's been um, quite a remarkable feat. Um, this uh, paper is uh, actually draws on to previous work that I have uh, I have done. Uh, the first is my book um, on taxing the digital economy, which is 
um, the Cambridge University uh, book, which was published in uh, in April and May of this year. And the second is a chapter in the Oxford University Press uh, Handbook on International Tax, um, which dealt with the issue of um, uh, the influence of international tax law on domestic tax law. Um, it expands on uh, both these two works uh, and really heads off uh, to look at uh, and is an examination on future trends in the international tax system. So I, 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 think, I think one way to view the changes that have occurred, um, firstly, is to acknowledge that they are very significant, but uh, that they are, in fact, there's a two stage. I mean, conveniently, you can think of them as BIPs 1 and, and BIPs 2. Um, and largely, I, I, I think it's probably fair to say uh, that BIP one was an, an update of the rules to modernise them and to deal with primarily abuses of the of the uh, of the tax base. Uh, the multinationals had been doing, uh, frankly, a terrific job um, of tax planning, and um, and uh, largely, when you think about uh, the action, various actions uh, dealing with um, uh, things such as hybrids, uh, uh, levels of indebtedness. Um, the uh, transfer pricing provisions uh, and the abuse of treaties, um, you come probably quickly to the view that uh, there was a need for uh, that updating and that uh, kind of modernization. But it was also clear that that wasn't sufficient overall um, and that uh, there were in fact, uh, rather than operational issues, there were in fact some architectural issues that were a problem and the big uh, elephant in the room uh, was uh, the taxation of highly digitalized businesses um, and particularly those that operated on multi-sided platforms um, really uh, enabling enormous participation in an economy without any physical presence and so um, this paper looks at uh, you know what were the uh, the fundamental tenets to the 1920s and the 1930s compromise. Um, I think uh, it's important to consider that that uh, the, the period of time of reform for our existing international tax rules uh, was actually probably uh, more like two decades rather than uh, just a few years. Um, and uh, so although it was begun um, by the four economists, uh, the work that took place in the 1930s, particularly uh, the work that was uh, shepherded by Mitchell Carroll um, uh, really sort of left us with the, the position that we that we have. And so we, we'll look at that briefly. Uh, we'll look very briefly at, at the uh, proposals in the 2020s compromise, because uh, they, of course, are the points of change. And then I'll go on to assert that there are at least three trends that have been progressed by the developments in the 2020s um, compromise. Um, and I would also just make the point, and I, I won't keep on going on about this, but um, that the changes are strategically important. Um, but in actual fact, the impact is quite modest in terms of the number of taxpayers affected at this particular point in time. Uh, and so largely, um, I think we should see this as the thin end of the wedge. Uh, I don't know if that's a, an expression outside of uh, English speaking countries, but um, what I mean by that is uh, it is a, uh, the, it's the beginning, uh, it's the opening of, um, of uh, and of course, when you have a wedge, uh, the more you force it, the more you can split things open. So, um, so the, the 1920s and 1930s compromise, just uh, very briefly, um, and I, I think when uh, when I looked at this in some detail for for my uh, for my book on taxing the digital economy, I was surprised just how random uh, the 1920s compromise uh, was. That in actual fact it was uh, not very principled at all. Um, it was in fact intensely uh, practical, and it really uh, certainly wasn't the first choice of the four economists. Uh, they would have preferred a wholly residence-based uh, taxing system. Um, and uh, but but uh, they also recognised the same uh, in, with the same uh, force that um, that much as though they hated it that countries were not going to abandon their right to tax uh, sources of income arising in their own jurisdiction. Um, the 1930s compromise uh, is is interesting um, 
the Americans have always seemed to have uh, people in great of great influence in these international um, tax uh, forum. And uh, Thomas Adams had led uh, much of the work in the 1920s, according to um, um, uh, O'Hare and Michael Gr and Gratz. Um, uh, but the uh, Mitchell Carroll replaced him after his death as the uh, lead person for the US. Uh, and he um, really sort of made it very clear that um, uh, that the, 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 the system should run off um, uh, uh, and, and this was adopted by the Fiscal Committee of the League of Nations, uh, that there would be a taxable nexus of the permanent establishment uh, and that the calculation of profits attributable to that permanent establishment uh, would be on an arm's length basis. Uh, the 2020s compromise, um, again, I'm sorry to move at such a hurricane speed, um, but the 2020s compromise, uh, of course, everyone I think will on this call will be familiar uh, with uh, the principles involved here, but uh, primarily pillar one uh, is to do uh, with taxing the digital economy. It's, it's aimed at um, uh, only approximately 100 companies worldwide, but they're an enormous, they are enormous uh, animals. Um, and uh, basically, the the uh, the issue here is that 25% uh, of residual profit um, will, and so there, there's a there's a, a, a profit split methodology um, between residual and um, uh, and normal profits, uh, and that 25% of that will be allocated to the market uh, jurisdiction. Um, it's actually pretty crude. Uh, it is more like, uh, in fact, a, an excess profits tax, um, and it's formula based uh, in order to try and simplify uh, the proposition. But um, in that simplification, uh, there are, in fact, some potential for significant problems. Um, the uh, source country um, uh, nexus is based purely on sales um, for uh, for reasonable sized countries, that's at least 1 million euros. Um, and it's expected uh, to be both implemented in 2023 and to reallocate uh, US 125 billion of profit to market countries. So not, not to be sniffed at, um, and, but still uh, it's not applicable to very many taxpayers. Uh, pillar two is, um, is uh, uh, somewhat extraordinary. Um, it introduces a new minimum level of tax of uh, 15%. Um, it applies to uh, a great many more companies um, because they will be multinational enterprises with a turnover of 750 million euros. Um, there are some other rules uh, there to do um, with, uh, which, are, which are based protection rules. I won't talk to uh, to them. Uh, it's ex expected to be implemented in uh, by 2023, uh, and new revenues are forecast at uh, US 150 billion per annum. Now, I think the three tenants that I I and I'm, look, I'm sure there are many many more. All of these things are, are, are sort of kind of um, assertions, really. Um, but the three tenants that I think are challenged by the by these 2020s compromises. Uh, 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 and these are, you know, like really, when you think about them, they, they've been absolutely fundamental uh, building blocks of the um, of the existing international tax regime. Um, so the first is a uh, a threshold nexus of a permanent establishment. We've uh, we've all been brought up and come to uh, love the concept of permanent establishments. Uh, of course, um, uh, actually. Largely, this has been a failure um, in the last period of time because of the success of the digital economy and by uh, the inability to tax both source and 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 indeed residence based tax, um, particularly out of the US, uh, because of their inefficient um, mechanisms um, to tax uh, foreign subsidiaries. Uh, we up until the 2017 reform, reforms, um, basically the the bottom line was that uh, um, that states uh, tried a variety of different ways um, to tax these permanent establishments, um, um, and uh, this new <clears throat> arrangement radically re revises and reforms that. 
Uh, secondly, the allocation of taxing rights on business profits. Um, now, this is, um, you, you might sort of think these are highly interrelated, they are, um, to the concept of permanent establishment, but it's really about uh, origin versus destination taxation rights, um, that um, the whole system has previously been based on um, a, a, a supply based, uh, where, the, where is the capital located, where is the um, uh, the, uh, the the residence of the of the taxpayer, uh, and um, that's where largely the taxing rights have been allocated. Uh, Pillar one uh, provides the opposite; it provides for an allocation of taxing rights on a destination basis in the country of, of the market, um, and that's a phenomenal change. Um, and um, and uh, the last point is the this whole idea of. Um, the Mitchell Carroll separate entity and arm's length principal to determine profits. Uh, this is a, 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 a again a, um, a formula apportionment based on sales. Um, uh, this will be uh, you know as controversial as um, as any of the preceding two, um, and actually is probably the by far the most difficult. I mean, how how do you allocate profits uh, to a source jurisdiction and and um, uh, it and the separate entity has has actually performed quite a good job. So um, in that sense, it's it's sort of sad. So um, to, to see it go, but it's, as I said before, that actually it's not completely gone because 99.9% um, .9 of the companies in the world will continue to operate uh, with a permanent establishment. So what big trends are there um, that I foresee? Well, I, I, I think what we have seen is more effective source taxation. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's a big issue, um, and uh, uh, we have seen reforms to permanent establishment, and now we are seeing um, even more radical reforms um, through uh, the abolition of the PE uh, and the uh, this idea that uh, the um, the destination focused principles um, allocating taxing rights to the market jurisdiction far more robust um, based on. Um, uh, a similar tax base to consumption taxes. Uh, the second um, major trend is a, a big trend towards multilateralism. Um, and scholars um, such as Irma um, and indeed uh, Ruth Mason have noted that, the, that there has been this extraordinary you know, an axial change in balance between uh, domestic tax systems and international tax rules. Um, and I, I think it's been driven by you know, originally the, the global financial crisis, the need for new revenue. Um, and um, in the paper that I wrote for the Oxford University Press, I put forward the idea that, uh, that what we're seeing actually here is something quite fundamental on a legal perspective, um, that it is uh, not customary international law, but I've, I've termed it consensus international tax law. Uh, the process of the institutions of, um, of, of, of the world getting together uh, to, um, to um, create instruments um, and, and then uh, a, a further layer of interpretation involving soft law, common interpretation and reliance on foreign judgments. Uh, something made clear in Eduardo's uh, Cambridge University book. Um, so um, the third trend, uh, again, incredibly interesting, I think, from this perspective is that um, I think that Devereux and Villa were right that that competitive behaviour cannot provide a stable long run system, and that um, that uh, there does seem to have been uh, a moving together of jurisdictions. Um, and uh, it's very interesting to read um, uh, Kim Clausing's uh, work when she looks at. Um, uh, the reasons why uh, cooperation um, is desirable. She says there are two reasons for that. Uh, one is to demonstrate fair taxation of winners from globalization. Um, otherwise, domestic voters turn protectionist and xenophobic. I don't know who she was talking about, um, but um, I think we can all perhaps have a guess. Um, and then secondly, uh, which is absolutely right, the, the, the race to lower corporate taxes um, actually protects um, uh, individual progressive income tax rates, because otherwise, uh, as we're seeing, in fact, in this country, um, people are incorporating companies when the individual uh, tax rates rise. Um, so it does actually have 
quite a, a, a consequential effect on um, on domestic um, uh, taxation. So, in conclusion, um, uh, the paper focuses on the changes to the rules, not on what's being retained. And I've made the point that, in actual fact, uh, for now, much has been retained. Um, but arguably, the, those three key tenets of the 1920s and 30s compromise are, are, are radically redefined. Um, and I, I anticipate that, and I'm sure there are probably many more than three directions of travel, but uh, to me, um, this idea that uh, we need to have more effective source taxation, uh, and, and I question actually whether necessarily uh, the new rules uh, will be that effective. Um, and I think they're quite um, uh, they're quite um, blunt, um, and um, uh, there there are issues of double tax, and there are issues of profitability in this in the market jurisdiction. Um, uh, but then, uh, what we also are seeing, I think, is uh, far more um, uh, multilateral cooperation, uh, the use of those processes and and uh, and instruments. And, and just an enormous trend towards cooperation at this point in time. Uh, and if we can work the tax out, maybe we can get the, the health and the environment and climate change and everything else. Um, that would be, um, it, it, that would be a, a noble um, objective as well too. Uh, and, and in my view, um, the 2020s compromise, if it's successfully implemented, which I guess is probably still a question mark um, because we might have political consensus at this point in time, but it's not done and dusted by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I, I think it's an illustration of the process of consensus international tax law. I think I'm over time, Miranda, I do apologize for that. Craig, actually, you've been very, very efficient, uh, especially given that um, uh, we started eating into your session with our introduction. So thank you very much for that. And, and I'm sure people will be aware that um, Craig has a, there's a very substantial paper and of course the book that really elaborates uh, on these ideas. Um, I have noticed a couple of questions in the chat, so just to let you know that I'm keeping an eye on those, but I'm going to go to our discussants first. So I think, Thomas, we have you as our first discussant. Um, and Thomas, uh, you're coming uh, from a political science background, I think, rather than an international tax law background. So this is one of the goals of the GTS, is to bring sort of interdisciplinary perspectives uh, together to, to get that commentary uh, on the law papers. So uh, Thomas, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miranda. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation and for organizing this, uh, this workshop. I'm really happy to be here and uh, to, to discuss uh, international tax with you. Um, Miranda has already said it, I'm a political scientist, so, so I'm not, not a lawyer, and uh, I guess it will show in my comments at, uh, at some point uh, that my perspective on some of these, these things is uh, a bit different from what Craig uh, has presented in, in his paper. But um, let me first of all say I, I learned a lot from reading the paper and actually from, from reading uh, lawyers' stuff on international tax anyways, I mean, uh, as someone uh, as a political scientist getting into this, we do, of course, uh, read uh, law a lot, as we do read economics, I'm sure you all know, and this is, of course, a very interdisciplinary field. Um, I have, uh, I have uh, two or three smaller points, and um, maybe I, I'll get the smaller points out of the way, and then I have uh, one or two bigger points uh, to make on the paper. Um, I think I, I will not only relate to what Craig has just uh, said, but also uh, talk a bit about the, what I read in the paper, which is not always one-on-one -on -one the exact uh, same, same thing. First, first of all, um, uh, Craig, you use uh, uh, a, a distinction between architectural and operational in the paper. And um, while I have some vague idea what this means, I wasn't quite sure whether this distinction actually um, sort of works. It, I mean, it's a, it's a nice metaphor, but I wasn't quite sure whether sort of there is a, a hard underlying concept uh, that distinguishes the, the, the two. Maybe, maybe you, you could in, in sort of revising the paper elaborate on this uh, or maybe this distinction, I, I, I wasn't quite sure. I mean, it, it sounds good, 
there's there's operational stuff and there's architectural stuff i'm but i i couldn't get my head around how the two are actually different from 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 each other um that is um that is uh, that is one one small comment that i that i have to make um and then um there is one other thing and that is maybe maybe not only um that is sort of gets us to to something uh, possibly bigger uh, that i that i thought thought about when when reading your paper i mean you um in the paper and less so in your in your talk now but in the paper it it sounds it sounds very much like you're talking about source taxation and and about uh, this uh, 2020s compromise being about sort of uh, making sure that that so the principle of source taxation will continue to work and to be effective, and um, at at the same time, uh, I found at least one place in the paper, and there there may be more where you actually say, well, it's not only source that is hollowed out, but it's also residence taxation. And while I totally agree with that with, with that statement, um, I, it, I I think there is kind of a tension in the fact that. A lot of what you write about, you, you make it sound that this is about uh, shoring up source taxation, and I think you you, you could be uh, you, you, you probably you should let go of this focus on source taxation. I would say, right? Be, because I I think it's not only about shoring uh, shoring up source taxation; it's about shoring up source and residence taxation and. Uh, so I, I this this got me kind of confused because you had this focus on on source taxation, um, right? And then I mean this the as as I read it the the main contribution that you want to make with the paper is really to to summarize what is new about the twenty twenties compromise when compared to the uh, 1920s consensus right and um I, I think this this makes perfect sense and um it's it's sort of i mean you're probably not the only one writing about these things but i think it's a it's a useful uh, a useful way to uh, to look at these things um however i wasn't entirely sure and you you said this in passing in your talk now that the the sort of you observe three kind of things that are very different or that that seem to be very new para paradigmatically new and um i wasn't I, I mean there's there's two observations I, I i would i would make on this the first one relates to my to the comment i made before that it sounds like well this is about shoring up source taxation but but actually when reading your discussion it, at many places, it reads very much like, well, this is not about saving source taxation. It's about doing something new and sort of getting to destination based taxation. And I don't think this is this is the, the, the same thing as source taxation. It's actually something new. So I think I would I would push you to make this clearer. And actually, I think in, in a sense, you are too defensive there when, when you say, well, this is just, just an extension of what we've seen over previous decades and years. The, the, you know, this thing of we need to think about what a permanent establishment and, and extension the defin and extend the definition of this and so on. And basically you say, this is the, the same thing. Whereas I would say, no, it's not. I mean, if, if you get rid of, in a sense, as you say, this is limited to a small part, blah, blah. But in a sense, if you get rid of permanent establishment, it's something new. It's not about source taxation, but about something else. And I think you this there, I would push you to to really say this is I would say the change is even bigger there than you than you make it sound in large parts of your of your paper. This is this is my, my first observation. And then the second observation is I think I mean, what what is really a fundamental change is that there is a minimum tax. I mean, this is the first time that there is a international agreement on on a minimum level of taxation. And uh, while you, of course, discuss uh, minimum tax, you, you in, I think you, you don't say this clearly. 
and I think it's kind of the the elephant in the room. Uh, this is this is something that that we didn't have before, never ever, right? And I th and I think this because you're sort of you you're looking for kind of paradigmatic changes, and I would say this is one, and it's a pretty obvious one. Okay, and then my and then my last point, and this gets me to the political science of uh, of things. And this is about your. I mean, this is the sort of the first half or the first two thirds of the paper where you uh, try to uh, pinpoint what is new about the 2020s consensus, and then you have this last third where you where you talk about these three trends in international tax. And there, first of all. I wasn't entirely sure how that fits together with the other two thirds. I mean, first of all, do you need it? I'm, I mean, may, maybe there's a difference between law and political science or the social sciences more generally. Sort of if, if we write a paper, we make one point, one argument and not two or three. So I was kind of wondering how, how does this fit in there? But even apart from that, um, I would, I would think I was kind of, well, maybe that's it's putting it a bit too harsh, but I was kind of bored uh, actually reading this, uh, reading this last part, because to me it sounds like what you do there is really like a legal positivist description of the of the processes and institutions going on and it sounds like well there is this international community and there is a problem or everyone agrees what the problem is and then they are very effective in finding solutions these great international organization uh, institutions they have the they have experts they do this and then they make great laws and so on and so on and I was thinking like, well, this is this is not the the world I live in, because uh, in in my world there is uh, interests of states, there is power, there is uh, maybe even there's ideas, conflict about these things, and um, here I mean I would just very generally uh, say that that I think there is actually uh, quite a bit of political science literature out there that talks about power interests uh, in in this game that you're that you're describing there and in the struggle for cooperation and the fight against uh, tax competition uh, tax avoidance and so on and i think um this to maybe i'm biased here but but to me this this would be uh, much more interesting than the than the rather dry description of the of the things that we that we have there i mean if you want to uh, just to to uh, to, to end with uh, some uh, some uh, how do you say that uh, at uh, um, public relations for my own stuff i mean we have recently published a paper martin hearson and i that is that i think could be a very useful overview of the political science uh, or a useful entry into the political science literature on these things uh, where we distinguish between um, power-based approaches, interest-based approaches, and ideas-based approaches. And then we also talk about uh, institutions. And I, I think um, maybe this, this, this could be a useful entry for if you want to have this kind of discussion in the end. Thanks for a Thanks. great paper. And sorry, probably I, I talked for no, a bit too long. Sorry. You're you're perfect, Thomas. Thank you very much. Uh, and Craig, I will give you a little bit of a right of reply um, uh, on that and other things. Uh, but really, very interesting comments, and certainly the institutional literature I find uh, extremely interesting in thinking about processes of lawmaking and law reform in the international arena as well. So I'm going to pass to. Uh, Erma Mosquera and Derek uh, Brockhuizen. I'm not sure who is going to speak at this point. Derek, is it you? <laughs> yeah, I so think I'm, Irma you guys and have I, ten um, minutes. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Miranda. Uh, Irma and I decided that I uh, uh, could take the lead today. Um, but Irma and I uh, work together on many things, so um, many of the things that I say will probably uh, fit with her ideas as well. So that's. Uh, Interesting. So we, we work both at the law faculty in Leiden uh, as lawyers, 
um, uh, but Irma uh, specifically and me uh, as well, bit for a bit, uh, try to incorporate some of the political thought uh, that's out there into uh, our work. Um, and Craig, well, uh, maybe my, my comments come from uh, that. Um, well, we, we try, I'll try to make the comments from that perspective. And I must say, I really uh, enjoyed um, the first uh, yeah, two parts of your article. Uh, provides a great overview of what's happening. And uh, I think I'll um, use it in my teaching uh, on international tax law. I think it's, uh, the overview is, it is excellent. So um, I, I'll consider uh, giving it to my students. Um, and I think it's also hard to, well, I find it hard to disagree with the first uh, two parts of the article. Um, in that, so my, my, my focus is mainly on the, uh, the third part. Um, uh, so getting to uh, the part where you set out the future of international tax law, it's actually where you try to identify uh, uh, the three trends of more effective source taxation, uh, more multilateral processes and instruments, uh, and the trends towards uh, cooperation. Uh, of which you say that they have uh, modest immediate impact that may turn out with dramatic impl implications uh, on the long term. So um, what you're trying to do there, perhaps to my own uh, idea, is uh, uh, looking into the crystal ball of the fortune teller. Uh, and I have two uh, general remarks uh, on this, um, of which I'll start with my first and then see what Irma has to say. And if we have some time, I'll, I'll uh, head to my second remark. Um, and my first remark, um, um, it's about the normative aspects of your uh, thinking, uh, because I believe that the 2020 compromise uh, and uh, hence your, uh, your work uh, seems to be driven by the idea that uh, political compromise uh, and with it consensual acceptance of international norms uh, advances the common good for all those involved. Um, and presuming that indeed your trends turn out to be uh, true, um, do consensus on the increased use of multilateral processes and instruments uh, and consensus of um, increased uh, cooperation are good things, or in other words, advance the common good, or are, are they bad? And I, um, well, there, there's many respects, and I think uh, it also, um, reflects a bit what uh, uh, Thomas Rickson has, uh, has, has just said. And that of course, uh, underneath the, um, uh, the consensual acceptance uh, the, of all those involved are power games to be played. Uh, and uh, the question I have is, okay, um, where are the developing countries? And uh, what about, for instance, uh, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the stance of the, the, the great power players? What are their, 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 what is their influence in this? Uh, in, in finding a consensual acceptance of all those norms. Uh, and there's another underlying current uh, being that I believe that things that are considered as bad or unjust uh, will not be upheld in the future as society will eventually get rid of them. Um, so I hope not to steal your thunder that uh, uh, I believe that you believe that these transformations are to be welcomed. Uh, so perhaps this question extends a bit the ambit of your paper, but I'm uh, seriously interested to hear your thoughts uh, about whether these uh, trends are good or bad, just or unjust. Uh, so that's my first question. Now over to Irma. Thank you, Derek. Um, thank you, Craig, for the paper. I, I have been following your work for a long time, and I really like that sometimes we have similar uh, ideas or thoughts where we would like to discuss. Um, one of... And when I look at the compromise, um, and when you see what happens now with pillar one and pillar two, I'm not sure that I'm that optimistic. And I'm not sure if we have an agreement for the sake of the agreement that is not good for all. And that's what I'm worried right now, because when you look at the pillar one and the pillar two, you look at the changes that are being made. I'm sorry, I have a call. The changes are being made are not really the changes that are uh, kind of the countries are puzzled by this, and especially the lower income countries, developing countries are puzzled by these changes. And when we look at and we say, yeah, we have reached an, a pillar one and the pillar two, the question is how this is going to be implemented, but also where the countries now have to give up other things, like for instance, the digital service tax, in order to achieve the pillar one, and whether that's good for them. And I'm also, what I have seen the last two, three years is that there are always come specific items of international taxation that have not been dealt with 
And one is, for instance, moving from this separated, separated entity and arm's length pricing to something else. And also, of course, the part of the allocation of taxing uh, rights. Um, so then I think that when we look at this OECD statement, and normally a lot of people are now discussing about pillar one and pillar two, but I'm not sure I have something right now to say about this being really the compromise and this really being the solution, but this being the result of a, a change of the power of the US saying we are going to move now towards a minimum tax, it's a package deal, if you don't go to the deal, if you go to the digital service tax, you will have trade retaliations. And this power game, I think that it is important to see whether it's really a, under a compromise. Um, there are two articles that I thought were interesting, uh, of two, one article and one comment, and one is that uh, Wolf and Schoen, that is a professor in tax law in the Max Plan Institute, he was saying that actually the principles have not, I mean, the principles were there before. We have a destination principles, a single tax principle, but what has changed in all these developments is the interinstitutional framework. And that this institutional framework is now different because we agree and we say BEPS inclusive framework is the one, the institutional framework, the institution. And then Alison, just to conclude in my part, Alison also say, well, if you are talking about institutions, why we do not create at the OECD a kind of a, a, a new working party on governance? Because it is not the same OECD, so many countries, but let's create a part, working party on governance. And I'm not sure if the OECD would take this upon, but I think that this is the institutional that we need to really see where, how the politics and the power in politics. I don't know if we have more time. Uh, Miranda, I'm looking at you for Derek. Uh, you, have, you have about two more minutes. Okay, I give it to Derek. Thank you, Craig. We can continue talking about this. I really enjoyed your paper. Okay, I have to ask my second question. I, I think I have a page of a question, so I have two minutes. Um, uh, maybe the, 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 the general idea of my second question is that I find many of the of, of the um, political compromise of the OECD uh, of an ad hoc uh, nature. So it lacks uh, principles, it lacks uh, ideas of where to go in the long run. Um, so um, considering that, that it's of such a political nature, that may mean that political consensus today may be overturned by political consensus tomorrow. And uh, so my question to you, Craig, is how does that reflect on uh, the, your views on your uh, the trends you identify. Do you actually think these are uh, there, there to stay, or is there a chance that, um, of them being overturned by a new political compromise in the future? That was very efficient. You do still have one minute, Derek, if you want it. Oh, well, no, that, that's it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both very much. And thanks all of our discussants. So, um, Craig, what I'm going to do, there's a couple of questions in the chat, but I think I would like to throw, we do have a little bit of time now because everyone has been so efficient. So thank you. I'm going to come back to you, Craig, because I think you've got quite a bit to think about there. <clears throat> One comment I might make just as I hand back to you, uh, your use of the word consensus, um, you, you may want to make some comment on it because it's relevant to your part three. But the, my observation would be it's important to think about this idea of consensus when we talk about what the OECD does, because the OECD defines itself as a consensus, as a technical, in tax, you know, a technical consensus-based process, nice, slow and stable institution. And so consensus has a particular meaning in the, con and, uh, in the context in which I think you're doing your work, uh, which might be a bit different from the way we would think of political consensus in, any, in other frameworks. So, Craig, over to you. You can respond to as much of uh, what you heard from the discussants as you like, and you probably also have another minute or two yourself because you were very efficient. And then I will come back to the questions in the chat. Well, I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, uh, but a, 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 apart from the fact that I really would like to say thank you uh, to, uh, to to all of uh, the people that, um, that made their comments, I, I think You've given me a lot to think about and, and a, a lot to work on um, in the paper. Um, uh, I, there, you're right. There's a there is um, firstly Thomas. The, there is an unhealthy uh, focus on um, 
uh, on uh, source taxation, uh, partly probably because uh, really my 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 study, my my research over the last eighteen months has been primarily about the pillar one rather than the pillar two work, and so so that that influences really, I guess, where I where I've come from on this, and I also see it as. Um, uh, as key parts of the response to the to the to the main tenets that, that that are identified in the in the front of the of the paper, but I, I take on board um, um, all of your points. I mean, the the idea about uh, architectural versus operational is really just meant to uh, to convey uh, a sense of a, of a fundamental structural nature rather than uh, an an individual. Um, Sort of technical tinkering, um, really. So it's a sort of it's a degree of um, size, really. Um, an excellent point uh, about um, the something new on the destination um, basis. Uh, so thank you. I, I, there are many uh, revisions that this will give uh, me the opportunity uh, to, to to this will give me the opportunity to make many different and and important revisions so uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the bit that has me uh, thinking and I don't I'm not sure that I have particularly the answer to it yet is the the linking of the second part to the um, to the to the first two thirds of the paper I, I guess it really it really was a change of gear it really was um, uh, a, a stopping of the of the analysis of the existing rules and and looking forward what the implications of, of that might be um, on the way forward. Um, uh, but I'll be deeply interested if you can send me um, uh, if I can't find <laughs> if I can't find the, the references I'd be I'd be extremely grateful for uh, the references and I and and, and I, I'm totally naive uh, in the political science area so I please um, forgive me and I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, for that aspect of it. Uh, Dirk, thank you uh, very much for your comments. Um, I, one comment I would say to the, to the question uh, when you were saying, you know, the advances, uh, do I genuinely think this is uh, a good or bad transformation? Um, uh, I, the answer to that is yes, I do. I, I genuinely do. I, I know it's, um, it's not, um, it's far from ideal. Um, for all the for all the reasons that, in fact, all of you have talked about, the fact that it is a political compromise, that it's um, you know that's a trade off in different directions. But if you think about where we started from, which was with a completely uh, broken system for taxing highly digitalized businesses, then this is an improvement, and actually, it's an improvement over digital services taxes as well, too, for all the multiple reasons as to why they are problematic, i.e., not creditable uh, issues to do with WTO, um, and uh, so you know there were maybe they could be solved, but but the point is they they wouldn't be solved uh, easily, and I think. Um, so I, I, yeah, I genuinely believe this is, um, and maybe I'm overly optimistic. I mean, I live in a you know very remote uh, country from the rest of the world. Uh, we have um, uh, we have um, quite a lot of harmony. Um, we're quite idealistic. Um, uh, we've got a cracking good rugby team, but apart from that, um, it's uh, it, it, you know. I, so I yeah. So that's that's broadly my philosophy. Um, uh, the Is it stable and here to stay? That's a really great question. I, I'm, I'm worried about that. That's why I guess I think the, the issues about, um, uh, uh, about the processes and about cooperation are incredibly important because uh, if there isn't, um, you know, I think I think um, the the Devereux Vela comment about the long term stability uh, not resting in uh, in competition is one hundred percent right, um, uh, and and in that sense, maybe the, the the pillar two elements of this not only are they the most controversial, as as Thomas was pointing out, uh, they are in fact perhaps the most uh, fundamental from the perspective of of possibly of stability, but um, uh, as in all things, they've often been uh, driven by 
uh, by American um, um, uh, sentiments and, and politics. Um, and consensus is a is um, is a. I, I think you're right, Miranda. I, I I use that word, I guess, probably to reflect. Um, it, it has a to to me. It has a slight, you know, where. I, impact on from the perspective of uh, of gathering together something which is not obligatory or customary law, uh, something which is um, a norm that countries can follow and are most likely to because they've they've worked their way uh, towards that position. Um, so uh, it's something less than a um, uh, than a than a fully fledged international legal principle. Um, but but um, nonetheless, I, I it's possibly the only word I could think of. Um, and um, uh, I, that, that probably, I don't, I don't know if I've, I've dealt with all the questions, uh, only, only to say that I've made careful notes uh, of everyone's observations. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a draft that needs some um, uh, revision. And so I'm very happy to embark on that process. Thanks, Craig. Um, consensus is an interesting word, isn't it? It's a sort of double-edged, it can hide, I suppose, power conflict interests, you know, in that political science sense, but it also is about uh, building some something. Yeah. Um, so um, if I go to the questions in the chat, we're not going to let you go so easily, Craig. I've got a couple in the chat and then, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's Petra, right, no do problem. you want, you, Petra, you had, uh, you had a question in the chat, but you've now raised your hand. Would you like to yeah, actually ask I it? I thought okay, it would be ahead. nicer to connect uh, by speaking. So thank you so much for the presentation. Greetings from Court Park. Uh, we don't have much time, so I'm going to go straight to the point. Um, so I started as a political scientist, so um, I'm aware of Thomas Eriksson is saying, but I'm also optimistic, Craig, so don't worry. Um, I support you fully in that. I'm a neoliberalist in this case. Um, so I, I hope for, for uh, you know, like a um, solution for the whole world. Um, and my question was sort of like, where do we go from here, right? We are somewhere on the halfway. And I have three, three ideas. The first one is what Thomas called uh, shift from source to destination taxation. And uh, Irma, I think also mentioned that, you know, some countries are just not as powerful. They don't have as uh, much resources to, you know, um, appropriate the, resor uh, uh, the taxes to be the source country just because they don't have a skillful tax administration workers, etc. So that's something that we should investigate. Second, um, it's not just about the corporate taxation, but also about all the other taxes and social uh, security contributions, etc. And that leads me to number three, which is the, the impact. It's not about how much money we spend in a country, but it's about what do we do with the money or what does the tax administration do with the money. So these are three ideas that I'm just uh, bringing here. And I would love to hear if you have more ideas, where should we continue with the research? Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. Um, I'm going to just may raise the one that's in the chat, the next one as well, Craig, because it does align with one of those, just to make sure I get it, I get that to you. And that is really back into the source idea. And I must say, uh, kind of on your behalf, I, I would have, I was going to push back a little bit against Thomas myself and say, actually, source still seems to me very important here. And I, I, if I was, if I was you, I wouldn't necessarily be abandoning it uh, or, or, or equalizing it with other the forms but that's something so the question is sort of about all the effectiveness of all those different kinds of source concepts we have pe digital pe you know nexus threshold and so on but it's really fundamentally about source so i'll throw it back to you craig yeah well uh, look um firstly thank you again for the further comments i i yeah, well i source has been um the the heart the root of the of the I think of the digital um, tax problem so I I, I guess that that I, I'm repeating myself really to say that that's the reason why I focused on it but but at the same time we had also failed very badly with residence based taxation um, partly the the mobility of um, of residents the ability to relocate to a different jurisdiction and and also the the um, disjunction 
between corporate and shareholder taxation and the fact that uh, you know the shareholders could be located in one jurisdiction and and um, and so you you put all those three factors together the two residence based ones and the fact that you weren't getting effective source taxation and hey presto you have uh, in fact um, you have the recipe for um, largely and they were largely large <laughs> uh, American digital companies uh, paying really effectively no tax in um, in in their foreign on their foreign earnings um, so uh, so I think that that has um, part of it and 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 uh, Peter you you're hundred percent right that that um, uh, the and, and Thomas talked about this as well too the the, the that destination, um, the the processes of destination might be clearer and and easier, and you can see um, through um, the various suggestions, which are in part in a Mount A. So uh, the the, the um, there's, there are if you if you look at destination cash flow based taxation, if you look at um, uh, residual profit allocation. Um, there are significant elements of, of destination-based taxation, of course, in that. Well, that, it's at its core, um, and 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 I feel um, at, that uh, the amount A concept um, goes a little way. Well, quite quite a long way, actually, really, um, to uh, to producing those as 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 similar outcomes. Does it go far enough? Uh, perhaps not um, is is the formula. I mean, I, I I think probably we should be a little worried about the detail about amount A because uh, there the, you know there is a possibility that um, if it's if things if profits and taxes are being allocated purely on the basis of sales uh, that may not accord to profitability uh, or it may not accord to real profitability. Um, it, it is very arbitrary in that sense. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there, there was one other question I just, I did see there that was just asking about the use of the word compromise. Um, the word is not mine, actually. I, I, I acknowledge it that it is. Um, uh, it's from uh, a description um, of uh, the historical effect and and the. Uh, particularly the work of Thomas Adams um, in the U.S. Uh, by uh, Michael Gratz and and um, and and O'Hare in a terrific article actually um, uh, that that they wrote um, about twenty years ago, um, looking at the, at the history of the nineteen twenties compromise. Um, so uh, I, I guess, but it does imply, uh, I suppose, that um, uh, and and without wanting to sort of go over old, old ground um, that the the I, I think it is our role to um, to point out deficiencies but at the same time we also have a, a role to point out when things might be getting better than um, than and I am and, and this returns to <laughs> to Dirk the, the point you made. That's why that's why I believe anyway that um, that these pillars um, put us in a better position uh, than say um, the position we were in um, without them. That... Yeah, you always have to think about the counterfactual, I suppose, uh, along this journey. Um, Thanks very much for that. We have got another question in the chat, but I am conscious of time and I think we do need to wrap up. It is the questions about production countries, which is really what I think of as source, but perhaps you're asking Hernan about something to do more with value chains or something like that. But um, I, I think uh, the challenge has been that income from goods production has became difficult to tax. And so, so therefore, because of digitalization, so therefore the new changes. Um, so uh, thank you very much again. That was our first session. Uh, thanks very much, Craig. And thank you to our discussants. Um, we will go straight on to paper two. Um, so um, I'm going to hand over to our next chair, my good friend, Eduardo Travers uh, at Louvain. Hello, Eduardo. Hello, uh, Miranda. Hello, hello <laughs> everyone. Good to see you. 
and I want to, to congratulate uh, the, the chair and all the speakers for having been able for an entire hour, not to mention the C word, huh? the C, uh, this disease that has been uh, disrupting our existence for um, two years now. Unfortunately, uh, you didn't mean consensus or compromise. No, you meant, no. <laughs> <laughs> you meant the other one. <laughs> yeah, the other one. Unfortunately, uh, all the good things have to come to an end, and uh, during this session, uh, we'll uh, we'll face um, developments. But uh, the, the good thing is that uh, we'll try to look at uh, uh, the positive side of it and uh, to see whether uh, this. Uh, uh, disease and all the con social consequences it had um, would in the future bring some uh, progress in relationship with digitalization and, and automation and focusing on uh, 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 an area of the world that uh, is uh, developing extremely uh, rapidly and uh, hopefully towards a, a better future uh, Africa. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome for this session, so our main uh, speaker, colleague uh, Afton uh, Titus from the University of uh, Cape uh, Town um, for uh, so the description of uh, uh, presentation of the, the paper that was submitted, and then we will have uh, two uh, discussions that I will uh, introduce after uh, the uh, presentation. Um, Afton, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction. I am just going to see if I can share my screen so I can get my slide showing. Okay, I'm gonna switch to slideshow so everyone can see that. Okay, yes. fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for joining me today. So the aim of my paper today is really to encourage African countries to use their COVID-19 response mechanisms to place their economies in a better position than they would have been, um, to place their economies in a position, a better position, my apologies, sorry, I've had quite a hectic morning this morning. Um, so I think I will just get right to it. So what I plan to do with this paper is to encourage African countries to use their COVID-19 responses to place their economies in a better position um, than they were before the pandemic, rather than just reinstating the status quo. So I think this could be done by encouraging the adoption of automation and digital economies in businesses and in the revenue authority. So I think this would also be most useful when governments are considering their responses at stage two and stage three to the pandemic. And that is at the stages when government is considering mechanisms by which to stimulate the economy and also means by which to counter the long-term implications of the pandemic. And I trust that innovations like this, yes, again, something coming from South Africa, will this time not result in any travel bans. So what I plan to do with this particular presentation is I'm going to set out why I think automation is important for Africa. I will then set out the tax policies that have been implemented to counter the negative implications of COVID-19. And then to set out why I think these could also be the automation tax policies. So in so doing, I'll set out some of the synergies that I see between these different sets of tax policies. And then I will briefly conclude by providing a few recommendations. All right, great, so my slide changed. So, why do I think automation should be encouraged in Africa? Automation holds incredible promise to improve the lives of Africans. And when I was doing research for this paper, 
I came across several innovations that are currently being used to do just that. For example, mobile robots are being used in vineyards across South Africa. And the way they are being used is that this robot travels down the lane in the vineyard every day, and it meticulously records growth rates and also growth anomalies. And this information is then communicated to the farmer. What is key about this particular innovation is that this information reaches the farmer at quite a critical stage. And that is when the farmer is able to put means in place to actually correct any anomalies. So this means that the farmer would be able to ensure that they could get the best possible harvest yield through information like this. I also came across several innovations that are being used in the manufacturing sector where automation is being used more and more. And what is interesting about this is that the manufacturing sector in Africa is showing phenomenal growth rates and it has great potential to absorb the mass influx of young Africans entering the job market for the first time. Of course, automation also holds great promise in the healthcare sector. So at the moment, um, healthcare products are being transported in Rwanda to remote areas through drones. And also prosthetic limbs are being 3D printed in Uganda and Kenya. And all across Africa, countries are using solar powered farms to generate electricity and in so doing, reduce energy costs. So what does this have to do with COVID and how can, it, can I use it in this paper? So when I looked at the COVID-19 tax policy responses across the globe, countries have been fairly uniform in their response. So you would see many countries introduce measures to boost cash flow, to reduce tax barriers, and generally to improve legal certainty at a time of great uncertainty. And when you look at what is happening in Africa, you will see that African tax administrators have implemented similar responses. So you would see mechanisms by which to boost cash flow and more generally mechanisms by which to improve taxpayers' positions by lowering tax rates and otherwise increasing deductions and capital allowances. This is interesting to me because I found these initial COVID-19 tax policy responses as being incredibly meaningful and significant when you consider what it could mean for encouraging automation in business. I say this because when I read the literature around automation and encouraging this use in business, I came across several projected fears of the worst possible outcome of this plan of action. So people write about how widespread automation will bring about mass employment, will bring about lack of skills, there's a cyber threats will be increased. And this rang a bell because this is all being faced by governments at the moment as they deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So my thinking here was, if governments are already developing tools to attend to the worst possible outcome of using widespread automation in business generally, then why not deliberately try to obtain the benefits of using widespread automation in your businesses and in your economy? And that is my thinking behind the synergies I see between arguing for COVID-19 tax policies then to be adapted and the priorities to change for governments to now think not only about recovering from COVID-19, but also to think about how the economies could move forward after COVID-19 or even during it. My other interest around COVID-19 and the tax policy discussions here have been about some of the long-term 
recovery plans for governments to undertake as they recover from uh, the implications of COVID. So many of the interesting discussions that have taken place are around the idea of introducing wealth taxes, uh, solidarity tax, environmental taxes like a carbon tax, or this idea of an excess profits tax. And I find these interesting because these are largely underused taxes by African countries. So they do represent an opportunity for African countries to use these taxes to raise revenue, to fund government expenditure. And if we are going to look at government expenditure, to look at ways by which we could use the priority of making automation important and then using these to fund that priority. So just briefly, I looked at this idea of a wealth tax. So wealth taxes can be introduced as a once-off measure or on a continuous basis. In an African context, most African countries have a tax on the transfer of assets, but not many African countries have a tax on the net wealth of particular taxpayers. So Algeria is an example of a country that does have such a tax, and it would be interesting to see if this sort of tax would be able to use, be used in Af um, other African countries. But as an idea, it is um, perhaps feasible for African countries to look into this as a mechanism by which to raise revenues. And as I say this, it is of course dependent on the context of every African country to decide whether this would be suitable for their jurisdiction. And I think it represents an interesting area for further research to determine how and in which circumstances this could be used. I also found this idea of a solidarity tax quite interesting. So the idea is that this would be a temporary tax that could be imposed on income or assets. I find it particularly useful when considering an automation priority by government because I think that it could be feasible in this context. So my idea here is that if you had a solidarity tax and you want to encourage automation, what I had in mind is that this would be a once-off tax and it would be paid by those businesses who have been successful in bringing automation into their operations. And this tax would then be used to subsidize other businesses who have not yet been so successful and as a means to encourage their um, more widespread use of automation in their business operations. So this I found um, something that may be of promise to some African countries. And then I had a look at environmental taxes, particularly carbon taxes, as they are used in Africa. So at the moment, only South Africa and the Ivory Coast have carbon taxes. So it represents an underused tax that other African countries could perhaps use by which to raise revenues. I think that an environmental tax would be an important component towards a government prerogative to um, increase automation more generally in the economy because of its possibly negative implication on the environment. So I think that this tax is something that would go hand in hand with this sort of um, government um, encouragement. And then I also found with interest the writings on excess profits tax or a windfall profits tax in a COVID context. So the idea here is that if a company made excessive amounts of profits arising from the pandemic, that they would then be subject to an additional tax um, over and above corporate or personal income tax. And I think this may be something that would be of interest to African countries if you consider that it's such a tax could be used to tax those companies that make astronomical profits from um, the widespread use of automation and digital technologies in the way that they run their businesses. Why I found this particularly of interest to African countries is because this type of tax already exists in the legislation of some African countries. In South Africa, for example, it was typically implemented as a wartime measure. 
So in the legislation, there is um, a description of how the excess profits tax would work. Um, and that mechanism was in operation in 1917 and again in 1940 with the outbreak of the World Wars. And then the Democratic Republic of Congo is currently implementing um, an excess profits tax when it implements a super profits tax on mining companies who pay up to 50% um, on the super profits that they make from their own operations. So I think this is useful because from an African country perspective, if you already have legislation like this on your books, you are then able to re-energize that particular legislation for a new government rationale, which I think would mean a lot less work generally. And then in terms of my recommendations, government spending would have to be considered here because it would involve some amount of priority spending in order to encourage and create the right environment for the widespread use of automation generally. All right, uh, sorry, I think I've missed a slide. I wanted to talk about the tax administration as well. So at the moment, tax administrators are taking advantage of the big data and data analytics. And they are using all of the potential that big data holds for processing the large amounts of data that tax administrators are subject to. So in Africa as well, um, I have some anecdotal evidence that the Revenue Authority in South Africa is using social media by which to inform their lifestyle audits. So the representatives at the South African Revenue Authority are said to compare the information that taxpayers file in their tax returns regarding their income and assets, and they compare that against the posts that are um, posted on Instagram and Facebook, and they try to determine if the declared assets and income would be able to fund that purported lifestyle. And in the event that those assets are inadequate, they then conduct audits to determine where the money is coming from. And I think it's quite an interesting stage in being a tax practitioner that you would then also be involved with advising your client about what to post on social media and what to rather keep private. So to get to the slide again, um, my focus then would be on government spending in the areas of education in trying to make sure that they have the necessary internet infrastructure and security and also to deal with any transition measures to um, encourage employees to upskill themselves. I then also consider that these taxes that are largely underused in Africa may represent a good opportunity for governments to raise the necessary revenues in order to fund the government spending that would encourage businesses to use automation more widely and also the revenue authority. All of this, of course, would probably be best suited with increased capital allowances for the increased use of machinery through this sort of prerogative. And then finally, for tax administrations, they are beginning to understand how data analytics could make their own um, processes more efficient, and they should continue to do this. So in terms of further research, I do plan to unpack how each of these recommendations could actually apply in a specific African country context or more widely to a regional block context to see if they would be feasible and how exactly they would work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Afton, and uh, congratulations not only for the context, but also for being having been able to to finish exactly on time like uh, it's 9 50 okay. now <laughs> uh, i'll leave the floor to our colleague rex rex arensen who is professor at leiden university um, specializing on um, digitalization and and the tax uh, processes among other things 
and then we'll be I'm eager to hear his, his comments. Rex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, perhaps even to all uh, participants. Let me start by congratulating, congratulating the organizers with a very interesting and, and multifaceted uh, two days of seminars. Uh, yeah. And thank you for, uh, for hosting it. It's really, really interesting and, and really, really relevant. And, uh, and the same uh, holds for Afton. Congrats, Afton, with a, with a wonderful uh, presentation. You're addressing a very, very relevant subject, spot on, I would say. Uh, both digitalization, COVID, all kinds of societal challenges. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, you, you, let's say you aim at investigating the potential of improved productivity and that automation and digital technologies might offer both to industries and to the tax administration itself. And, and I would like to challenge you a bit, if you're okay with that, on, on two, two themes. One is the opportunities uh, perspective, and the other one is the automation uh, perspective. But let me start by the opportunities one. Um, because to be honest, I would have loved to learn more from the, um, the examples you present in your paper. They, they really struck me. Wonderful examples. You, you presented them in your slide deck as well. And I wondered, um, why are these so successful? And could other countries perhaps make use of learning experiences? Uh, what might be circumstances in which these innovations become productive? And are there perhaps circumstances or factors which, which want to impede the adoption of these innovations? Um, for example, you are probably aware of the wonderful M-Pesa paying system in Kenya. It really took off. Stirring innovation, even uh, related to all kinds of tax administration payment processes. It's a wonderful example of, of innovation be, being so successful. So I would have loved to learn more about the positive side. Could perhaps African countries leapfrog and, and jump into a next state of automation and digitalization? a theory that might be useful perhaps to study these kind of adoption processes might be a Rogers diffusion of innovation uh, theory. Or you might even want to um, conduct SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Because to be honest, um, you are focusing a lot on the threats, in your paper, yeah, the, the, the skills one, the cybersecurity one, they all make sense. I would be very interested in learning from the positive adoption um, factor approach. So that would be my, my first challenge because I think if we could understand these adoption mechanisms, those specific factors might be tax targeting points if you know how to encourage businesses to start investing in specific innovative applications you might want to focus tax instruments on communication or financial uh, incentives or others so there might be nice linkage between learning more of these factors and um, guiding your tax policy initiative. So that would be my first challenge, perhaps. The second one relates to automation. And, and great if Frederick could present my slides, because I wondered how do you define automation? And I thought, well, let's, let's perhaps try 
and have a quick chat on this because automation might mean several things and it might even resonate with one of these three or perhaps even all three because if you look to the transition uh, the world has gone through in in the light of, of of all kinds of digital innovations you might say we started with just digitization and just converting let's say from analog to digital we're now probably in a phase of digitalization in which many countries many organizations many many institutions are substituting paper-based processes into digital support processes on a one-to-one -one basis you might say that the processes and the people stay more or less the same but well paper is, is, is more transformed and, and replaced by digital applications whereas the real benefits and the real opportunities might come from digital transformation in which both governments and businesses create new businesses new business models that are guided by all kinds of digital innovations it's really changing the way we work leisure and uh, interact um, and that more or less relates to one of your final parts and in your paper in my final part of this contribution it relates to a bit of a guilty pleasure of mine the digitalization of tax administration because i think looking from a digital transformation perspective i think we could try to reimagine what tax administration and tax policy might be in a digital age so again not transforming current policy initiatives into digital supported ones but really trying to design um, fully new both policy initiatives and tax administration initiatives let me finalize with one or two final remarks in that respect um, if you try to capture digitalization efforts related to tax administrations you you focus and and that's quite okay on risk management on the use of data analytics rather enforcement related you might say a, a bit looking in the rear mirror oriented whereas i think if you really would be innovative and tax administrations would be innovative you could perhaps try to um, let's say make it more easy to be compliant and make it less easy to be non-compliant so try to be on top of it and in front of it um, for example by trying to introduce together with businesses compliance by design systems which support citizens and businesses to be compliant and um, well then i'm back at where i started because that might be a great opportunity for well tax administrations in african countries to on the one hand encourage citizens and businesses to be compliant and on the other hand help them into introduce digital innovative solutions which which by themselves being compliant by design create great opportunities and that's i think a very valid point you are addressing that so uh, again my uh, my sincere compliments heading over to you uh, chair Thank you very much. Um, now we'll hear our second discussant, uh, Ana Paula Durado. I'm looking for her on the, the screen. Ana Paula hi. is a high Good professor morning, of tax law at the University of Lisbon, a well-known uh, face in the world of international uh, taxation. Uh, the, um, the floor is yours, Ana Paula. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning, uh, Afton. Um, congratulations. I enjoyed very much uh, your presentation. Um, is it 
um, possible for me to share some slides? Yes. I don't need to do it, but. It will be possible now. Okay, we'll try. Okay, I'm sharing. Let me see if I find them here. There is a green button. Should allow you to share screen. Okay, just any, just one minute to find them in my own screen. Otherwise, okay, I think it should work now. I think you can see. Yes. So these are some of the main aspects that I would like to highlight, taking into account your presentation. Often um, you started with the COVID um, measures uh, in the context of the, uh, well, initially in the context of the initial steps of the pandemic. And um, we were all following the recommendations by the OECD. And uh, it seems that uh, the recommendations towards Africa um, or African countries were not um, that different from the ones that uh, were addressed in respect um, of um, the whole world, I would say. Um, so it, it, it seems that in, in, for example, uh, taking into account um, small and medium sized uh, companies or the relationship between employees and uh, employers, um, the, the, the measures um, initially were very similar. We all wanted um, that unemployment did not increase too much, that bankrupts, uh, that um, um, there would not uh, be any um, situations uh, that would uh, be very uh, dangerous to the, to the economy and so on. Uh, and then uh, after that, um, you mentioned a second, some kind of a second phase um, that looks um, more, a bit more at the future and not necessarily at the, at the, at the hot um, situation in the middle of the crisis. Um, and that's an opportunity um, to, to um, increase um, the, the, the rise of the economy, to, to, to uh, develop um, to a certain extent the situation in uh, some African countries at least. So the first fears on mass unemployment or lack of, skill, lack of skills related to um, the introduction or increase of innovation seem to have been overcome. But then my, my question to you would be uh, the following, the first one. Can we really handle uh, African countries as a, a unit? Because of course it's a, a huge continent and uh, you can't compare the economy in South Africa and, for example, the one in Nigeria with other African countries. Also, um, the, the idea that I have from my own experience um, in, in as um, well, um, um, granting some assistance to policy tax policy making in Africa and drafting legislation is that there is not much communication and dialogue um, among the, the countries. We have several uh, regional organizations such as the SADEC, um, at least that, that's how we pronounce it in Portuguese, of which, the, of which South Africa is one of the major um, member uh, countries. But um, it, in terms of solidarity um, and dialogue, does, it, does, for example, SADEC, using this example, does it really work as an organization that would grant uh, some uh, recommendations to uh, its 
member countries? Does it uh, work in a solidary manner in terms of uh, tax policy um, itself? Um, so my question would be, can you really handle um, African countries as a unit? And within the organizations, the regional organizations, do they really work in terms of um, granting uh, recommendations and assisting uh, one another. Um, taking into account specifically the automation um, um, example or the automation development, the idea that I have in terms of, um, or taking into account conversations um, we are uh, having with, um, um, our partners in uh, Lusophone countries is the following. There is some fear in some of these countries to um, really engage into automation because this would uh, mean some kind of uh, lack of control by um, the, the politicians or even the, um, the highest uh, ranking officials. And therefore, uh, automation would be uh, a good step in terms of reducing corruption, but maybe not everyone would be interested in automation. So I think there are different levels of development um, in terms of engaging into automation. And it's very much related to the level of corruption. This is not um, scientifically um, studied yet. Uh, it's only intuition, but it would be an interesting topic um, to address. Also, in terms of automation, there are fears um, regarding confidentiality. Who um, can access these data and uh, how are the data protected? You also mentioned um, after uh, the solidarity tax, excess profits tax, super profits tax on mining companies. These are very interesting aspects and I would like to ask uh, whether um, this will be really uh, temporary or whether it would make sense that this kind of taxes um, would um, be there for the future. Um, and then if, if we talk about um, solidarity taxes or excess profits taxes, the, the next question would be whether they would fall on net income and uh, whether, um, I don't know the situation in South Africa, but in, in many other um, African countries, it's very difficult to, to tax any profit due to the current international tax rules based on transfer pricing. So um, if we take the example of mining companies or even petroleum companies, what happens is that um, in, as a matter of fact, they don't um, have relevant uh, profits, tax profits to be taxed uh, in the source countries. Um, if we take the example of petroleum uh, tax, um, then we see that uh, for more than 20 years, um, due to the specificities of the business, there are um, co so costs exceed um, uh, profits and therefore uh, there is no tax for um, a long time. And when there, there are profits, then um, transfer pricing rules will imply that um, no tax profits will take place in the source countries. So how will an excess profits tax work in this context of the, the current rules? And should this excess profits tax, uh, well, under another name, possibly uh, be based on another ta uh, type of um, uh, tax base itself. So not on net income. Um, similarly to what we are now discussing, for example, in the context of uh, pillar one and um, attribution to um, taxes to, to market states. Um, just, 
a couple of uh, more points. Um, also, when we are talking about taxing um, on the basis of solidarity, so higher income or wealth uh, tax, um, my, my question is uh, whether there are uh, savings or enough savings in African countries that uh, will allow um, tax administrations to, to um, tax on the basis of solidarity or tax the highest uh, income. Um, because in, in many countries, uh, we know that due to, to the high um, interest rate, um, there is a higher risk um, in investing in those countries and uh, personal savings themselves, uh, they are not uh, placed um, in those countries. Um, then um, there is an issue about tax competition. If there are a couple of countries that will raise their taxes very much uh, as an opportunity, I would say, taking into account the, the, the current situation. Will this lead to tax competition? Will this uh, lead to, um, to exit of companies? Uh, what are the risks inherent uh, to this kind of uh, politics? And finally, just a short comment on um, what you referred um, as a tax administration uh, taking into account what is going on in social media. Um, this is very interesting. It also happened in Portugal, for example, uh, some decades ago, um, not related to social media, but to this um, kind of uh, magazines or journals in which um, the, uh, some people show their um, houses on their way of living and uh, the tax director in Portugal was really recommending um, the officials to to read those magazines and then to go, uh, to um, initiate uh, any audits uh, on that basis so um, that's very consistent and um, I think it results also from the dialogue among uh, tax administrations worldwide um, so thank you very much. I'm looking forward uh, to listen to your reaction. Thank you very much, Anna Paula. I'll leave uh, um, some time for Afton to uh, uh, answer, and then we'll have a, a short Q&A uh, session with uh, the audience. Thank you so much for those comments. Um, I find them incredibly useful. Um, so to begin with, if I may start with your comments, uh, Rex. So you spoke about um, the imbalance that I have in my paper insofar as I'm focusing quite a lot on the threats versus all of the positives um, that I could emphasize a bit more with uh, this particular paper. I am so glad that you mentioned that because I am, you know, being very close to this paper, I'm aware that there is something not quite right with it, but I can't figure out what it is. And I think that you've helped me to sort of determine what is wrong with it and why it doesn't quite sit quite right when I read it. And I think that's quite correct. So I can only say that it's probably um, a throwback from my um, practice days as an attorney. You know, the focus that you have on hedging bets and focusing on risks, because I'm trained as an attorney, I think, to see everything that could go wrong and then plan for it. And I think that's what this paper does. So I think if I let go a bit more of that training and I start to think more about the positives that come from automation and all of the examples that I have come across in my research, I will start to put that into the draft to make it a bit more balanced. In my writing, I do try to give a more of a positive spin on um, just general development. I know inter international tax can be quite depressing um, if you're writing from a developing country perspective. So I think that this would be a good start for me to just put some of that in practice. And then you spoke about um, some of the definitions that I ought to consider when I look at uh, when I use these terms of digitalization. And I think that in my excitement in doing the drafts, I probably missed that beginning step. And I do take your point. I will put something in the draft to deal with that. 
And I agree with you that I would probably be more thinking about the digital transformation stage, more the future speculation stage than uh, where we are at the moment. And then when we spoke about the digitalization of tax administrations, I think it's an exciting idea that you have to think more about what tax administration could be rather than what it is. And I agree with you that there's great potential for tax administration to not just be responsive, but to actually be forward looking in terms of the information that it requires and um, how that required information could be used, maybe even before the taxpayer is required to file a tax return. Um, and I find this very exciting because I am quite a fan of science fiction. So this gives me an opportunity to just imagine what um, a world would be like with complete automation and just the thought that as someone running your business, if you have you know, information coming in in real time and you have to generate invoices, what if the opportunity was there for you to just immediately send relevant information to the revenue authority as part of the software package, that it was just as you calculate VAT, for example, with the software, it would also immediately communicate this information to the tax administration to determine whether there's any particular risk for the administration or whether there's certain information that you should now already begin to accumulate because this is what the revenue authority needs at the point of that transaction. So I think that's phenomenal. I think it's uh, very exciting. Um, and I do look forward to the idea to imagine a bit more about what tax administration could be. So thank you very much for that. I do find it very useful. And then Anna, it's such a pleasure to meet you, well, face to face. Um, I've communicated with you before, but I've never actually seen your face. So thank you so much for taking this opportunity. Um, it's interesting that you should ask me about whether or not we should treat Africa as a unit. Um, and I find that interesting because that's, of course, what we are trying to do across the, uh, the continent when we imagine this African continental free trade agreement. The idea that we're going to have one giant continental market and that we're going to overcome our economic differences as vast as they are to try to make this giant market workable. And I must say that um, in my optimism, I am really excited about this idea, about this agreement. And I do try to find ways to bring tax into the discussion because that never happens. Everybody just dismisses tax as something that is impossible to possibly implement with this agreement. And I'm, I'm pushing against that. So I think when I drafted a paper like this, in the back of my mind, I did have an idea that there would be some sort of coordination continent wide. And I think that your point uh, makes me realize that I need to make that thinking more explicit. That if I am thinking about the continental trade operate and um, free trade agreement operating across the continent, then I'm thinking towards something moving in that direction. I do take your point that without this, it would be very difficult to imagine how the pockets of African countries who are so different could possibly find um, commonalities across some of the policies that I am suggesting. So that gives me some room for thought. I do need to think about which direction I want this paper to go then. I could focus on regional blocks as I have in the past and consider the examples that come from those regional blocks and how the tax policies I propose could be implemented there or I would have to do a bit more work and consider about, um, or put something in there about the disparities across the different African countries and how I imagine notwithstanding that for my policies to have some sort of traction in what I propose. So that is something for me to think about. Um, you also mentioned the corruption and how it relates to uh, government's um, policies and also around automation. So, I do realize that that is something that uh, would play a role. I'm not, I don't really have any amount of expertise to try to do uh, the empirical work that would come from trying to determine numbers in terms of the corruption levels and how it's exactly being implemented. So I think that is something that um, is interesting and I would have to think about um, its incorporation and I do take your point that it would be relevant um, here. 
And then um, there would be some concerns around confidentiality and the use of um, data that you uh, uh, gather from taxpayers and how revenue authorities use that. So I think that there are some works um, around uh, data protection, some legislation that is coming out. Um, so some African countries do have legislation to address uh, the use of taxpayer information and just the information available online. So that is something that I would consider. Um, and then you mentioned how I imagine um, taxes such as the solidarity tax or an excess profits tax working within the current proposals in international tax around um, you know pillar one and pillar two and the mechanics of actually implementing an excess profits tax is interesting when you consider it um, at an international tax level i think for the most part my paper was focused on a domestic level to try to get a particular grouping of countries or a country to a certain point but i do think that that is something that i should consider as well just initially off the top of my head i would imagine that i would have to draw back significantly and refer to um, Professor Christians and uh, uh, Professor Margulis as paper on pillar three um, and their proposals about the windfall profits tax and whether how that would be related to pillar one and pillar two. So that would probably be a good start. And then with tax competition, I agree that there would be some concerns and um, some certain finessing that would have to go on regarding how these particular uh, tax policy measures in one country would affect the tax policy measures in another. And my thinking around this is that when um, I talk about these government initiatives to bring about this type of activity, I have in mind that this would be you know, real tax competition that would be uh, you will be talking about that countries will be competing for real economic um, activity. I don't necessarily think that, that type of tax competition is bad. Um, I don't necessarily think it's something that you, you would have to stop. Um, but I think also that that is something that would perhaps deserve its own paper on um, the types of tax competition that you know would ha um, hurt other countries and which would not. And just interestingly, I have actually submitted a paper to Intertax to deal with that um, particular aspect. Um, and then finally, I found your comments on social media and the now I am learning fairly consistent approach across the world of revenue authorities to social media to be very interesting. So it seems like um, people are thinking in exactly the same way across the world, which is good, I suppose, if we could develop um, a more consistent approach generally about how people and um, how revenue authorities deal with the massive amount of information out there. So um, I found that quite interesting uh, to find out that this is just not something that happens in South Africa, but um, in other places as well. So thank you to you both for your comments. Um, I did find them incredibly useful. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, some minutes left for uh, uh, comments from, from the audience. There was a, a discussion in the chat about uh, uh, tax on automation and tax on robots. Is there uh, anyone who wants to address the topic or another? I can't see. Um, Eduardo, it was yes. me who raised the question about yes. um, taxes on automation. I was mm -hmm. just struck struck by Afton by your comment about the de the delights of automation, and I like I I agree. But you know, it's been controversial in places like the U.S., of course, uh, and quite a lot of proposals coming out of the U.S. for some sort of tax on tax on on machines, tax on AI, tax on on robots, which in my view is not a good idea, but you know, the, the debate is out there. So I didn't know if you had any debate like that uh, happening at home. Um, thank you for Maybe that. Maybe after um, I leave, uh, Joachim ask, uh, ask a question and then you answer. Okay, sure. Joachim okay, Engel. thanks, Chair, and thanks, Afton. Um, my, my question is actually rather related, so I'm also skeptical of, of robo-taxes, and maybe that's also why I'm skeptical of your suggestion to have this solidarity tax, because if I understood correctly, it would be paid by those that have successfully automated in order to subsidize, uh, subsidize those businesses that haven't as yet. And in my view, that would economically have the effect of sort of penalizing uh, those that have been successful, and if it's a recurrent tax, it might even act as a deterrent uh, for further automation 
And I mean, I, I could understand this kind of logic if, if it was about a transfer of know-how from the successful to the unsuccessful. But we're talking about the transfer of money to, um, uh, well, propel the automation in African countries. And that should be something that should be a concern of the entire society and not just of the successful uh, businesses, because money can be provided from, from anybody, not just from successfully automated businesses. So I, I would think uh, rather than, you know, uh, penalizing those that have been successful, uh, have some, well, automation tax, if you like, or such as a surtax on, on high income earners, for example, um, to make them pay for, for subsidies if you deem them uh, useful uh, to this extent. And, and then uh, two smaller comments. Um, I, I like this idea of, about the wealth tax, especially if it may, might be a one-off thing. And there is, I uh, just wanted to point out some, some very interesting studies provided by the UK Wealth Tax Commission 2020 uh, that you might find useful reading. And uh, regarding the automation of the tax authorities, I cannot help uh, commenting that um, VAT GSD might, of course, be a, a rich source of increased revenue if you get um, a more efficient tax administration there. So you mentioned that in one of your comments, but it was not so much in the presentation. And I think that is something definitely to, to look out for. So in Europe, we have a clear trend, for example, now, but also in other parts of, of, of the world uh, towards real-time reporting of, um, of transactions, and that can massively help in uh, fighting uh, tax fraud. Uh, and under reporting. And um, I, I think these are avenues that should also be explored, especially because uh, the, such taxes are such an important source of revenue, I think, in, in the global south. Thank you. Thank you. Afton. Uh, thank you so much for those comments. Um, so uh, first, with respect to the robot taxes, um, there hasn't been so much debate in South Africa specifically around this tax, but I am aware of quite the significant amount of literature, just generally internationally, coming out um, about robot taxes. I myself am not, I'm not really in agreement with the idea of implementing a separate tax specifically to be imposed on machines. I think that the existing tax bases could be used um, to achieve the same outcome if what you need is increased revenues. I would uh, be more in favor of using existing tax bases rather than trying to invent a new one from a machine. It's just the idea of it just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, but there are others who uh, do believe in that. So um, that's just not something that I would necessarily agree with. And then about the solidarity uh, tax, I do take your point that it does have a penalizing effect. Um, that you would have businesses who are doing um, well with machinery um, to then have to pay the solidarity tax. I have thought about that. And my thinking around this is just, um, it, would, it would depend on the way that it's marketed really to uh, attend to uh, the taxpayer morale that would come about from imposing such a tax. So uh, I guess the marketing spin would be along the lines of, you know, uh, do it for your country. And if you pay this tax, we would be able to, um, bring about improved um, quality of life for your fellow citizens and all of that. So I, I, I fully agree, it is penalizing. Um, and my thinking around this would be that it would be a once of tax um, and it would just be something that you are going to market to your taxpayers as fulfilling a specific function. Um, and my idea around that would be making sure that you are accountable and transparent about how this tax is used and to communicate, especially to your tax base, that it is producing a result. Um, I realize as I'm saying this, that I am speaking from this from a particular South African point of view, in that we have a problem with tax morale, and a lot of it comes around with uh, because of uh, the failure to properly account for where our taxes are going, especially when we have a small tax base. So my thinking then is that in a South African context, for example, if you were as the government to say that this is why we're implementing a solidarity tax and to explicitly state that this is what the outcomes are, I think that for South Africans, we would not be so concerned about paying an additional tax if we could actually track what that tax is doing, which we cannot always do with um, the taxes that we pay at the moment. So my thinking is that if we are able to keep a level of transparency in place where people, as the people paying the taxes, 
have an ability to see what is changing because of that payment, that we're able to soften some of that discontent around having to pay this very specific tax. And then thank you very much for your comments um, and suggestions around, around the wealth tax um, and uh, the UK's Health Tax Commission's um, uh, uh, um, publication. I'll have a look at that. And yes, I didn't mention the real-time reporting in terms of the VAT um, and some of the other examples that were in my paper. Um, I had to make a, an executive decision about how much I would be able to include in my 10-minute show. Um, and I wasn't quite sure if that would be sexy enough alongside the social media um, <laughs> talk. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's time to wrap up the session. Uh, thank you very much to uh, um, Professor Hapton uh, Titus and the two discussant. I think um, uh, it's true that we have to, to think at how what is happening now may influence the shape of our tax system. Uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, most of uh, our taxes or the taxes that we are applying now have uh, endured uh, already more than one pandemics. Uh, we've got a long tradition of taxation in the world and we, we shouldn't probably think that everything uh, has to change. Uh, for example, we've taxed uh, in throughout history uh, machines like windmills uh, or cars and it didn't uh, uh, stop us from, from eating bread or uh, to, uh, uh, to move. Huh? So we should should carefully think about what we can do. Um, I, I sincerely think that uh, the African scene is a, a place uh, of real um, uh, innovation as regards digitalization and government. Uh, when we see what's been happening in the area of financial uh, education, uh, the same could happen in the area of, of tax. Uh, we This is the advantage of Africa not having to uh, to cope with, uh, let's say, 19th century style bureaucracy that we have uh, uh, in Europe and being able to jump <laughs> stages and, and, and enter into a new, a new, new world uh, in, in automat automation and, and taxation. So we'll, we'll be watching that uh, closely in the, in the near future. Um, I think we've got now a seven minute uh, break and we will resume at uh, 10.40. Very warm welcome to, a very warm welcome to the second segment of our Global Tax Symposium 2021. Uh, greetings from, from London. In the first segment, we fundamentally focus on, on, on contributors based in Africa, Europe, and Asia Pacific. And we fundamentally use a law and political science perspective in order to illuminate core problems emerging from the international tax regime. Now it is time to, to move to Asia and to offer a law and economics uh, approach to some of the most fundamental issues emerging from international taxation. So I am delighted to introduce Suranjali Tandon. Um, she's a, a professor of economics at the National Institute of Public Finance and, and Policy in India. She, she is based in New Delhi and um, we will be linking New Delhi with Munster in Germany and Washington in, in the US. I will be presenting the discussions in due course. Mm -hmm. Suranjali will be presenting her paper on, on one of the fundamental innovations introduced by BEPS 2 I'm referring to the, the global minimum tax. Suranjali, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eduardo, and uh, thank you for picking such wonderful discussions to the paper. I know they're experts, and I look forward to the comments. So I'm going to start uh, presenting. I hope my, uh, my slide is visible to everybody. So, um, uh, you know, when I'm thinking back on the global tax reform, which is the minimum tax, I think there is need to discuss why this reform was necessary, uh, whose tax system needs to be reformed, and, you know, should we be looking at tax systems alone, as in, do, tra do taxes matter by all and by themselves, 
or are they a function of very many macroeconomic factors? And also to think back on you know, the last seven years of the BEPS program, wherein there were different action points, uh, different measures were adopted, they were supposed to close the loopholes, but how far have we gotten and perhaps have they failed in some sense uh, the need to reform a corporate tax system? So um, with all that in mind, I'm going to uh, begin with first a very broad description of the pillar two reform. Um, I don't want to go much in detail because I know a lot of uh, the attendees are experts on the subject matter. But just to sort of bring everyone uh, up to speed, we all know that this will apply to companies which have global revenues above 750 million euro. Uh, once the company does qualify under pillar two, uh, the next step would be to determine the corporate tax base. Now, you know, it's not as simple to say everything qualifies as, as the income under Pillar 2. There would be an aggregation of income across constituent entities. There would be some adjustments for carry forward losses. You know, intra-group dividends would be excluded. Then, of course, um, you know, to calculate the effective tax rate, the covered taxes would have to be also estimated for all the constituent entities which in a sense has to be adjusted for pillar one tax because uh, you know that takes precedence in, re in reallocation of profits. Any sort of taxing back through subject to tax rule, which is applicable on you know, uh, intercompany payments, uh, which are, on which withholding is charged through bilateral treaty. And of course, uh, digital services tax are not covered. So once you know, the taxes that are charged to the constituent entity, are calculated and the tax base is estimated, the effective tax rate is computed. And, and you know, we're talking about a 15% minimum tax rate. It's, it's at the moment, a lot of optics. Uh, it, it, it represents, um, you know, it generalizes ratcheting up of tax rates, but we have to see how the carve outs, especially for, you know, tangible and payroll effect, uh, uh, the realization of uh, tax gains. But that being said, um, you know, the aim is to sort of bring up the tax rates, uh, especially in low tax jurisdictions, up to 15%. Now, to facilitate this is an income inclusion rule, which is to say that the ultimate parent entity's jurisdiction can tax back the difference between this 15% and uh, what the current rate of tax in the jurisdiction is. And you know, to facilitate this, you have the switch over rule, which is to say that you know uh, the, the the country could move from a, a exemption to credit method. Then you have the UTPR, which is a backstop to say if the, if the constituent entity or the ultimate parent entity does not adopt the IIR, uh, this income could be taxed elsewhere. Uh, interestingly, there are adjustments also available for guilty, uh, which are applied in the US, and this assumes significance because a lot of companies that could be covered. Uh, under uh, the pillar two would be US residence companies. And uh, you know, when we talk about the 15% minimum tax rate, when we talk about treaties, uh, the minimum rate is really 9%. So that's a sort of broad snapshot of how the pillar two reform will pan out. Of course, the details are awaited and, and the OECD will put out a more detailed uh, uh, suggestion on what the design of the law would look like. But using this framework, uh, I think the discussion in the, in, in the subsequent slides will rely on uh, the framework as is. Um, so, you know, the first question is, if this reform were to be implemented, uh, what will be the macroeconomic shifts? Now, um, there is, of course, uh, the immediate gain of revenue. Uh, different academicians have sort of uh, taken their, their stab at the numbers and closing has the missing numbers wherein uh, you know revenue would accrue two thirds of the revenue gains assuming the 21 percent which is no longer true but even with the using the cbcr information recorded for u.s corporations two thirds of the revenue would accrue uh, to the united states uh, you know devil it all speak of the minimum tax as a key to removal of incentives and can affect adversely investment in these jurisdictions I'd like to sort of point out at the moment that you know, when such uh, changes are set in motion and if investment changes tax base across countries might also likely change, uh, which is uh, you know, the set, this is the third point that I've mentioned there, that the tax rates today that are set by developing countries are in a sense a function of their uh, structures 
of their economy, uh, of their other ancillary regulations. And to sort of ratchet up tax rates would mean that all other uh, all other things, which is the income tax base and even the revenue collections, uh, will go through a shock. Uh, what what is more interesting is that you know we think of this reform as uh, the end in terms of fixing the corporate tax system, but there could be pressures on the indirect tax system as a result of moving up the tax rates. Uh, so the first question that you know comes to our mind is that who is going to pay uh, the, the, the higher tax rate? And uh, I know that statutory tax rates are not essentially equal to the effective tax rates. Uh, there have been studies to suggest that they approximate in many countries, but for many others, uh, let's say for Estonia, the difference is more than 20%. But leaving that complication aside, just looking at what the statutory tax rate, corporate tax rates are today, we see that below the orange line are countries like Ireland, Bulgaria, Paraguay, UAE, Cayman Islands. And you know these are the countries that we assume the profit would be redistributed uh, from these countries back to the uh, residents and source countries, depending on how the IIR and STTR play out. So this is first natural on what happens if, if everybody in 136 countries agree to implement uh, the minimum tax. <clears throat> uh, who stands to gain? I have presented uh, Kloss, uh, Professor Klossing's uh, results. But this is really going back to the Forbes 2000 uh, list of companies. And what I do here is to look at their sales revenue and look at whether these companies were profitable at all. So this is, uh, this is the ballpark estimate. But what we see is that there are 1134 companies within the top 2000 list, which may qualify for pillar two, uh, if the said countries do sign up for it. Uh, and 24% of these companies belong to the US, uh, headquartered in the US, followed by China, Japan, and, 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 and Germany. So um, what this really is a snapshot of the uh, redistribution, as we may think of it, of profits from the uh, rest of the world, which are charged a tax rate lower than 15% to uh, the said countries as headquarter countries. Uh, as I've already spoken about, uh, the, the, the other leg of the reform is, reform, is the treaty system where, where we talk about withholding rates. So the withholding rates are below 9% uh, if STTR is implemented bilaterally, uh, you know, the rates would go up. Now, what I'm really showing here is that if the STTR, let's say, is to be implemented, uh, in which case, or to which incomes would uh, this apply? And now, if you take, let's say, the case of interest, there are 240 treaties in the world between developing countries and developed countries that have an interest rate withholding rate less than 9%. Similarly, if you look at royalty, there are 302 treaties in the world today between developing and developed countries that have a withholding rate less than 9%. So in a sense, uh, you would have a massive shift in treaties that would be reformed by adopting the SCTR. But the question really is, will it be adopted? And on this, I want to sort of reflect back from the evidence uh, that we saw for the MLI. Now, the MLI, I think, was the first evidence in international tax to suggest what will happen uh, if countries are given the option to reform the tax treaty system. Uh, what we see is interestingly that there are countries that excluded uh, their bespoke treaties with bilateral uh, you know, uh, preference, preferential treatment, uh, how handed out. And, uh, you know, this included countries like uh, Switzerland, Norway, Germany, which uh, had a significant number of treaties which are not covered under MLI. Of course, there was no, not as much of a response to PE articles or improvement in the PE provision. Uh, there were countries, including developing countries like Hong Kong, Isle of Man, uh, Mauritius, Seychelles, and even um, a country like Singapore that excluded the application of Article 12 and 14. And, uh, you know, looking back, uh, the, the, the big win for MLI was the application of the PPT, which was an anti avoidance measure. But one only thinks back whether this was enough because of the changes that we're recommending or thinking of under the STTR. Uh, it really means that the, these reforms did not add up to very much. 
Uh, also, this is a reflection of how willing would countries be to uh, reform their tax treaties. Uh, the other question uh, that, that comes to one mind is if the income inclusion rule was really like a CFC, why didn't we sort of stop at CFC? Now, you know, it's very important to go back and look at the history of CFCs, and I don't want to spend so much time on it because there are a couple of other slides that I want to go through. Um, but, but, but it was really determined by the internal uh, economics and politics uh, of the countries implementing it, whether you take the US in the 1960s trying to achieve capital export neutrality, trying to tax back passive incomes. Similarly, France and Germany wanted to tax specific types of income and introduce a CFC rule. And then you come to the application of guilty recently, which was, uh, you know, taxing back foreign incomes, uh, but the reduction in domestic corporate tax rate. So it was a careful calibration of expanding tax base and lowering uh, tax rates. The, the, the important point for CFCs is that they were not consistent. Uh, you know, even the EU left the option to countries whether they wanted to you know, tax full income of low tax subsidiaries or limited to artificially diverted uh, incomes or of subsidiaries. So, so that option having been left, countries adopted a patchwork of CFCs. And, and I think what has happened is that the thinking has moved beyond CFCs because uh, unlike the guilty and the beat in the US, which do not per se require the establishing of an anti-avoidance uh, in a transaction, all other CFCs require this, and there's been conflicting approaches of court. So what, of course, so what basically happened is that there has been a massive shift in thinking of uh, what is the ideal way of taxing incomes, which is to ratchet up rates and not just having to sit back and establish uh, uh, what, uh, whether it was a violence or not. And, and what the pillar two reform really seeks to do is to get the acceptance of source countries, because if you read the document, the declaration, it says that developing countries, not all countries are expected to sign this, uh, but in a sense are uh, okay with the principle adopted for taxation. And I sort of swiftly say that, you know, there, are, there, there has been shifting of goalposts of the OECD uh, in terms of tax competition back in 1996, where it was seen that, you know, there were countries that were undermining tax systems across the world. Uh, slowly shifted and uh, the, the ambit became narrower to 1998 where, you know, the definition of harmful that that competition be, became important, where the exclusions for incentives to, you know, plant and machinery uh, were introduced and tax havens per se, which lacked transparency had low tax rates were looked at, uh, you know, in, in a negative light. Move on to 2002 when there was identification of tax havens. Uh, the process was not always transparent. There were questions on how countries were listed, whether it was selective, exclusions were qualified or not. And you know, countries like Hong Kong, for, for example, were not really called tax havens. Moving on to 2011, this is post uh, you know, financial crisis. We think of expanding of tax base, reducing of tax rates. And countries sort of did the latter more than they did the former. Move to 2013 when the BEPS program is introduced. We restricted ourselves to IP regimes and harmful tax practices and uh, adopting the treaty of use standard as a minimum standard. Basically, what this means is that the evolution of thinking has sort of turned a circle. And now uh, the definition of tax competition seeks to become broader and to say that you know low rates themselves are, uh, are harmful. And of course, you know, there were other measures like this EU state aid rules, which were not meant to harmonize, but in a sense have not been very successful in taxing back. Uh, the main issue with tax competition so far has been uh, establishing the counterfactual as to whether the business moved only because of tax rate changes and with which has not been successful even in the US. So, um, you know, without dwelling any further on the rest of the points, what, what I see is that there is a significant shift in, within the residence countries to look at the tax rates afresh and to say that it's not about avoidance alone anymore. It's not about, you know, CFC rules which apply to specific incomes. There should be a certain threshold of taxation. Uh, this is just to show the race to the bottom, which has been that the, the, the you know, mean rates have declined over a couple of years. So why are tax rates low? And this is the part that I want to dwell on uh, significantly. It's, it's a function of many things. It's, it's a function of norms. It's a function of fiscal capacity. 
and and you know we look at low income countries as a part of the problem right we look at their share of fdi flows to the gross national income as being excessive but there is a flip side on external account these these countries are extremely vulnerable to capital uh, flight uh, to shocks and therefore you see that they are also indebted and in some sense the thinking on tax is determined by these factors i also asked the question whether tax sits in as a substitute uh, to capital controls or the structure of the economy so you know i'm not going to put, to put the results out here but just to say that uh, you know per, we say think that per capita income being low is is a, is going to lead to low corporate tax rates but that's not true we see higher income countries uh, sort of handing out lower tax rates in terms of capital outflows uh, uh, control on capital inflows we see that you know developing and developed countries do not behave similarly developed countries tend to have higher corporate tax rates when they can impose higher control on inflows which means that they tend to gain more uh, independence on their um, on, on their policy in in terms of asia you see uh, you know a flip side if there is a control on inflows in order to uh, foster economic activity they tend to lower their corporate tax rates and if you look at the external uh, the capital control controls on outflows if they are higher uh, in asia they tend to be followed with higher corporate tax rates uh, and the flip for the oecd so in a sense capital controls are complements for developed countries and sub, uh, substitutes for developing countries in asia uh, for tax rates and so is the structure of the economy so uh, if they do if they do use tax as a substitute or complement for overall regulatory or or structural issues of the economy does that mean that tax to uh, gdp ratio is low of course there is a linear relationship between corporate tax rates and direct tax to gdp ratio but we shouldn't look at it only in 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 such terms it's also important to look at the level of income in the economy and surprisingly you know the usual suspects of low taxation Uh, are also uh, also qualifies high in terms of tax to gdp ratio overall tax to gdp ratio uh, in comparison to all other countries which is to say that uh, if we are looking to reform the corporate tax system perhaps it's reforming it for the developed countries that uh, seem to have molded it for their own benefit rather than smaller countries which are thinking of many other metrics when they are designing the tax system so for example you look at cayman islands and panama the sort of above the oecd average uh, you know brings us to question what this corporate tax reform really seeks to uh, do for these economies and uh, you know the last part really focuses on whether incentives should be done away with now uh, the pillar two reform seems to want to tax back any tax incentives being offered uh, to companies um the, the name of the countries have gone missing on this but uh, if you believe me Uh, on this uh, there are countries that are developed countries which are uh, which offer more or higher uh, incentives as a percentage of their gdp than low income countries so the suspicion that you know smaller countries are handing out incentives uh, and, and undermining the tax system is not entirely true but that being said uh, should these countries should smaller countries be giving up their right to offer incentives well uh you know the evidence is mixed there could be certain incentives like r&d that don't work in a country like india but there are incentives to exports that seem to work at firm level so the, the box at the bottom uh, really shows that uh, if there is an export incentive the sales of a company uh, of, the, of of each unit or of each company goes up uh, with the offering of such incentives so therefore uh, you know to treat all incentives as blanket and tax these back may not be a fair way to do that the other is to say that you know whether corporate tax incentive or corporate tax rates can influence investments and again the answer is not uh, a strict yes or no there are different countries where it does respond uh, over a period of time there is a long run relationship for example like in uk malaysia south africa and so therefore the ability to offer incentives should not necessarily be taken away because if we go back to uh, the first slide as we were talking about fdi and external debt Uh, the current account is vulnerable to shifts in investments investment flows to the economy and so therefore uh, removing tax uh, incentives may not be macroeconomically uh, necessarily macroeconomically stable so what's the future of the tax reform 
Um, there are a few key takeaways from the paper. One is to say that you know their tax rates are not harmful per se. They are a function of a macroeconomic structure. So, for example, you know the countries that rely on, on, on agriculture will tax differently than those on industry. Some incentives work, but the important thing to remember is that when revenue foregone is given up, does not mean that it will be revenue gain because some of the tax base will vanish. Uh, if the IIR is to apply, uh, it will apply to certain companies and what you might see is a fragmentation of the corporate tax system for many years until the thresholds are brought down. Uh, there might be also competition to move residents to other countries or uh, maybe I can you know, discuss that later if there are any questions on how this has been happening and some of the anti-inversion rules can act as a backstop uh, to an extent. The other is to say the problem has been shifted out of the ambit of taxation and now the other regulations must take over and correct for these problems. And so will we see a new uh, form of regulatory arbitrage? Uh, I think the key sort of takeaway is that tax avoidance, uh, the discussion has moved away from tax avoidance. And now we're looking at taxing better than just saying that you know a corporation avoiding uh, is the problem. Uh, the remaining problem is that, you know, does this address those countries' issues? Uh, or is it more tailored to a resident's country uh, economic needs? So I'm going to stop at uh, that. Thank you so much. Suranjali, thank you so much for your, I mean, thought-provoking view of the minimum tax from an emerging country perspective. And now I'm very, very happy to, to invite Joachim English as our first discussant. Joachim is food professor of law at the University of Munster in Germany. Joachim, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Chair. Um, I will try to share some slides. Let's see. Um, should work, hopefully. Yeah, you should have them now. So um, thank you very much, uh, Suranjali, for your presentation, of course, for the interesting paper that I read. And I'll try to keep all my comments within the 10 minutes that I've been assigned to. Um, so uh, what's the paper about? Well, um, as I see, the research focus is really on the question whether the Globe, as now agreed, is actually improving the international tax system in terms of international equity, but also in terms of economic efficiency, or whether it's rather a a broken um, concept that mainly serves revenue interests of a few, <clears throat> namely primarily uh, European uh, nations. And um, this analysis is carried out consequently, uh, primarily, even though not uh, exclusively so, from a developing country's perspective. Um, uh, I think uh, even though several uh, methods are used, the core methodology is really an empirical analysis of the drivers of low effective tax rates, in particular in um, emerging and developing con uh, com uh, countries, uh, so as to, to challenge uh, the hypothesis that low rates are basically always a manifestation of uh, international tax competition, strategic um, uh, tax competition in the sense of a strategic game. Um, no, they, they there could be other reasons for that. That's what the paper tries to show empirically, primarily. <clears throat> and then we have some uh, descriptive elements on the history of CFCs, for example, or on the workings and mechanics of the globe. And we have, uh, interestingly, also some normative parts, especially on um, our tax sovereignty and also on uh, to what extent a tax competition should be considered harmful or what criteria might be useful and which ones might not be to uh, to make that um make that uh, well uh, value judgment and then I, I think the key finding of the paper essentially is that globe is inadequate it's a short approach that kills too many good things that ignores um legitimate macroeconomic reasons for low effective tax rates especially in emerging and developing economies uh so, oops, there's one slide missing. <laughs> I should first say what I like about the paper, and I do like uh, the paper because especially, of course, it is one of the few ones out there so far that really adds a developing country perspective to the discussion of GLOBE. So far, most of the papers we see, as well as the public consultation submissions, are dominated by a Global Norse perspective, if you like. And this is really a, an important paper uh, taking a different perspective. Uh, so I think that that is much welcome. And uh, connected to this, um, it does 
challenge of the narrative that is predominating in you know the bubble of the IF and, and especially of course of the OECD that we need a global minimum tax uh, also in the global south to end strategic tax competition. Um, the paper is trying to show that this is not the case and uh, I do not necessarily agree with all the conclusions in the paper but I think it's important that we have this debate. And um, finally, um, I, I think the paper is really strong in providing original empirical analysis um, to uh, the various uh, macroeconomic rationales underlying uh, low tax regimes in particular, but not only uh, in emerging and developing economies. And I found particularly interesting, but that's not to say that the rest was not, that's just the one thing that, um, that I found most exciting, uh, the empirical analysis on, on a, a negative correlation, if you like, between capital mobility and uh, the capital tax burden, uh, which kind of um, contributes to a, to a broader debate on, on this uh, relationship. And so I think that is a very valuable contribution here. Now, uh, I think as Commodore, I should, however, mainly talk about where I see room for improvement. And uh, there are a few points uh, where I would make suggestions. First of all, I think um, the paper would benefit from a proper introduction. So it jumps directly into the mechanics of the globe. And I would like to first read something about, well, the research interest or question or hypothesis, um, the methodology and the structure of the paper. So that I think could be added. Then uh, the paper, uh, um, very well eloquently criticizes and, and, and also does empirical um, analysis to criticize a, a revenues land. So um, the uh, well imbalance in terms of the revenue effects of the minimum tax benefiting mostly the US uh, um, and Japan and, uh, and a few others. Um, but I think uh, it would be fair here and in any way useful uh, to also do to the extent possible a more dynamic analysis. So we see a trend right now um, to have domestic effective minimum taxes. So the US has just, uh, or is about, sorry, in the Build Better Act uh, to enact uh, an alternative minimum tax based on the international tax uh, model. So the Globi, uh, the EU will do that uh, in the directive they will propose uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, Switzerland is contemplating it. And from what I've heard, other countries are too. And that, of course, has huge implications for revenue allocation. And the question is, couldn't that also happen in emerging and developing countries so that they, you know, by levying um, domestic effective minimum taxes, which have priority of the globe, according to what we can see also in the most recent um, leaked publications, um, those domestic taxes will have priority over an international collection of the minimum tax. And so it's the, if you like, source countries that would collect the tax. And doesn't that change the picture? And if it, that's not an option for emerging um, developing economies, it would be interesting to read why not. Um, third point, um, I, I think um, sometimes there's an unspoken change in perspective, or at least the perspective is not so clear to me on whether what you analyze is, is really the effect on global welfare in terms of efficiency of the globe or in terms of national welfare for certain specific economy um, emerging or, or uh, developing economies. And of course, that makes a difference. Um, uh, and related to that is the question, um, are you actually looking at discrete investment choices from a firm's perspective um, that low rates could attract? Uh, or is it about marginal investment that could be increased by low rates? Um, because especially the first point, so the discrete investment projects, well, the question which country attracts them, of course, made a huge difference for the welfare of that particular country, maybe. But from a global perspective, actually, it might be bad if, if the country with the lowest tax environment attracts uh, those projects. So to really be a bit more specific on is your interest more, you know, in a specific countries or group of countries perspective, or is your efficiency sections more about the global um, uh, social welfare um, that a globe could or could not um, uh, support. And then um, I think, especially when it comes to tax incentives, it would be useful to look a bit more into the details of the Globi as we now have it in the October uh, 8th agreement and also in the leaked November 5th um, draft on the model rules. Uh, because um, there are several elements that I think um, 
could qualify a little bit your conclusions about Globi taking away um, tax incentives or neutralizing tax incentives, especially in emerging and developing countries. Why? Uh, because um, we have a, a carve out um, that does provide, especially in the transition period, where we start with high percentages, eight and 10% um, of, uh, of assets and payroll, uh, that does provide some shelter also, or uh, maybe for some access profits actually. And so that could still make it attractive to offer incentives, at least for real investment. Um, we have um, uh, deferred tax uh, expenses that will be uh, treated as equivalent to actually pay taxes, especially when it comes to R&D um, incentives such as immediate um, or accelerated depreciation uh, and, and similar um, uh, incentives. And so that allows to keep those incentives with full effect. And we have things like the treatment of refundable tax, uh, tax credits as direct subsidies, so not reducing the numerator in the ETR fraction, but rather only um, increasing uh, uh, the denominator, which means the effect on the ETR and therefore the effect on the minimum tax is much reduced. So if you design your tax incentives as refundable ones, which is also useful actually for um, stimulating marginal investment, especially for SMEs, uh, and then you don't have to fear so much uh, the international minimum tax. And all these things um, could lead to the conclusion that actually the minimum tax will not you know, harm so much uh, those uh, incentives to the extent that you consider them useful. Uh, and that is something I think that should at least be discussed, even if your conclusion were a different one. Um, brings me to the next point. Uh, there is a lot of interesting insights in the tax incentive section, but I lack a little bit an overall conclusion. Um, so the question is, the question that, that you ask in this section in the, in the heading is, can and should tax incentives continue? And I don't read an answer at the end. Uh, I, I read elements of an answer in the section, but I, I'd like to have some, and if, if qualified or inconclusive or some yes, some no, but there should be some, I think an overall answer to this section. Um, at one point in your paper, you acknowledge that it's also um, possibly uh, higher BEPS risks uh, in developing emerging economies that are caused by a relatively lower administrative capacity in the tax administration that um, are a cause of lower rates because, of course, if the rates are low, there's less risk of BEPS because BEPS is then less attractive. And at the same time, you say, but Globi is no adequate answer to deal with that issue. And I wonder why, because I mean, Globi does curb BEPS incentives by making BEPS less attractive because there will be a, a certain floor. And, and why is that they're not helpful um, taking away those BEPS risks and therefore the problem? Um, is it the problem that it's, it's imposed from the outside? And if, if that's the problem, why is that actually a problem in this context? So I think that could be specified a bit further. Um, and then uh, in the end, the paper uh, acknowledges there is a need for reform. So the international tax system is in a way uh, broken in that it still offers after PEPS, uh, BEPS 1.0 um, uh, avoidance opportunities. And however, uh, Globi, as said, is a shotgun approach doing too much harm. Uh, so it's not a good idea um, on how to deal with those issues. But the question is, of course, what else then? Um, so if you say there's a need for reform and you say about Globi, even though it might have some benefits, is not really a good answer because the drawbacks are really significant, then what else? Um, so that, I know that's maybe asking a bit much, you know, um, but at least, you know, it's, it's, it's I, I find a little bit problematic to say there is this reform now. Um, it's bad, but we need reform. So the question kind of that, that is the, so what else? So I think it could be very briefly mentioned at least, do you think we need to strengthen the BEPS 1.0 rules? Do you need we need do you think we need something totally else like a destination-based taxation of residual profits of all profits? Is that feasible, more feasible than the Globi? So maybe a, in the outlook, a short comment on that would be useful. Um, two final comments, rather small ones. Uh, I think there's a several studies on the BEPS effects or, or drivers for low rates in developing countries. I'm aware of six, that's the ones I've found, but there's probably more. And I think, you, you know, they, they could probably be included in the analysis, at least uh, be, be cited and, and referenced. And then there's, I think, some some updating or, or um, well, uh, 
amendments needed in, in minor aspects, and I'm, I'm happy to specify maybe in an email, such as, for example, the percentages um, of the carve out, which is now 8%, 10%, no longer 7.5%, um, or um, the question, what did I put down? Um, yeah, the rule order is pretty clear now, which in your paper you describe still as, as a bit open, and, and as a few things like that, um, but that's minor. So thanks a lot. Um, hope that was useful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joachim English from the University of Munster, Germany. And now um, we are moving to Washington. I'm delighted to invite Corey Hillier uh, from the International Monetary Fund. Um, Corey is senior counsel in the legal department of the IMF. Corey, over to you. Thank you for that introduction. And I also have um, some slides, which I'll bring up now. Perfect. Okay. Well, it's ticked over to um, 5 a.m. in the U.S., so it's becoming increasingly more a sociable hour. So hopefully um, these thoughts uh, become even more coherent. So let me start with... Um, thanking um, for the opportunity to, to be a discussant today. I found the paper by Suranjali to, to, to be a good and thought-provoking one, uh, like we've heard. So, so I was going to start with the scope and, and some key takeaways of the paper and following the structure of the paper. So, so the first section is what is the minimum tax proposal? And of course that's outlined nicely in the paper, but, 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 but there are some updates particularly to reflect the final agreement. Um, and one example would be the final substance-based carve out became even more generous over the first 10 years, which does also impact on, as we've um, heard from Professor English on, on, on both tax rate pressure plus um, the ongoing viability of incentives. The second um, section of the paper, uh, which talks about were the CFC rules enough? And of course, the conclusion is no. Um, and we would tend to, to agree with that, given that uh, residual profit under the current system is capable of being shifted using the arm's length principle. Uh, and lots of those profits are active ones and, and not, you know, passive income that standard CFC rules uh, tend to address from an anti-deferral, anti-abuse uh, perspective. And so IMF uh, 2021, which is the, the book on corporate tax, certainly makes that argument. Why and how to fix the, the corporate income tax system? The paper argues the need to recognize the characteristics of the economy uh, that has an impact on the tax structure. Um, and looking at tax settings in isolation ignores individual factors. And I think that's, that, that, that's an interesting perspective. Of course, the question in the context of a multilateral agreement uh, is, is how do you bring a more principle-based approach that, 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 that countries can agree to with, without always taking into account individual circumstances, but, but the point is, is clearly made. Explains why low corporate rates um, exist with macroeconomics, uh, also uh, a nice um, dimension of the paper, arguing that low CIT rates are not just a challenge for low income countries and so hints at more fundamental tax competition profit shifting story, story but also other factors. Um, and certainly the IMF board paper of 2019 would support that too. Can and should tax incentives continue? Uh, the, the point's clearly made that it captures a fragment of other countries' potential tax base. And I think this is important for informing responses. And so behavioral impacts plus dynamic effects of the global minimum tax are gonna be important. And I'll talk briefly about those on the next slide. It could also trigger a shift towards the adoption of other replacement interests, uh, instruments, particularly non-CIT tax incentives uh, or non-tax subsidies. And of course that, that gives rise to trade law issues as well, but we've already seen some countries thinking about a shift towards subsidies to replace the tax breaks, which the paper also mentions. What's the general conclusion? Well, it argues that the OECD-led minimum tax uh, impacts the sovereign right to design domestic tax systems. Uh, the inclusive of framework agreement clearly favours residence countries over source countries, uh, giving priority to the income inclusion rule, for instance, over the under tax payment rule, without fundamentally changing the allocation of taxing rights. Potentially triggers other replacement measures and therefore the paper suggests it's not a complete comprehensive solution, especially for low income countries. So thinking about the minimum tax, I wanted to just briefly focus on two key areas of the paper and that's tax rates and tax incentives. With the global minimum tax, uh, which brings into account this effective tax rate concept, 
uh, you can clearly um, determine the effective tax rate through the statutory tax rate, but also um, reducing incentives. Um, and so they're the two key elements that, that the minimum tax is designed to address. If I just bring up this laser pointer. So a couple of key points to note. Well, one is that, uh, which the, the paper also makes, is that the global minimum tax uh, now potentially creates this, this parallel system of in-scope and out-scope M&Es. And, and, and Surinjali clearly says the international tax system will become bifurcated between large and small companies. Uh, but also another dimension, of course, is that it's a common approach. And so there's also a parallel system between adopters and, and, and non-adopters. If we look down here, uh, the impact on, on tax rates and certainly low income, low tax countries will have an incentive to raise tax rates. And that's clearly one of the dynamic effects. But maybe the paper could also talk about possible trends. So trends toward two tiered tax systems. We've already seen Ireland uh, with two rates for in, in scope and out of scope M&Es, but also for the group of 35 that Suranjali mentions, and, and lots of those are, are no CIT countries, possible trend toward alternative minimum tax with the same rate and base as pillar two. If we look down at source countries uh, and the impact of, on tax rates, there's obviously a disincentive to lower rates below the minimum because of the top up tax elsewhere. But a key element of the paper is the consideration for, for low income countries. And, and here there's a couple of things we could note uh, and the paper does note in, 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 or, or at least hints at. The, the first one which the paper makes obviously is that it could have, low income countries could have benefited from a different rule order. Uh, so for instance, giving, gi 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 giving the under tax payment rule priority over the income inclusion rule. Uh, we, low income countries need to be able to enforce tax rates above the minimum. Uh, and so the paper clearly uh, notes how developing countries or low income countries are prone to profit shifting, which, which, put, which often puts downward pressure on their rates. Simplicity is important. Um, and so one interesting aspect that Pro Professor English also mentioned uh, was can domestic minimum taxes overcome rule order? And so will we see a continued trend towards those? Uh, the last point I wanted to make on tax rates, um, and particularly in the context of the subject to tax rule, uh, is that, um, that that is particularly relevant for, for, for source countries, and, and Suranjali's paper does talk about low rates maybe being uh, more appropriate for, for, for economies with large service sectors, but of course services provided remotely um, do give rise to asymmetric treatment, particularly for source countries where, where, where tax bases might be eroded through deductions, and so that subject to tax rule uh, will become particularly important for them, um, and hopefully given the, 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 the loss of the fight on the rule order, the, the scope can be expanded to cover cross-border services more broadly rather than just interest and royalties. The last group of um, collection of thoughts I wanted to make was on, on tax incentives because that's the other piece of the puzzle. Uh, and so up front, you can see that the global minimum tax um, strengthens worldwide taxation. I think that's a general takeaway, which can reduce the benefit of tax incentives abroad. And so again, the paper talks about uh, the potential um, um, taking of, of, of the tax bases of other jurisdictions. But of course, the final agreement has a number of special inclusions and carve outs and so on and so forth. And particularly the one that um, you can see, particularly with the, the, the US, China and Japan being, uh, as the paper suggests, um, some of the key benefactors or, or benefiting from it. There, there, there are some special exclusions uh, which arose in order to reach a global consensus. And so one particularly uh, that China supported was the, the special concession for m and in their initial phase, which, which does give them a, a holiday from the under tax payment rule, which might signal that they might not apply the um, income inclusion rule for those m and in that initial phase. So you can see that there will be some tax incentives that will, will, will continue as a result of, of, of what you might call uh, special exclusions, but there's also some general exclusions. And so again, there's a generous substance-based carve out, which means continued competition and incentives will exist over non-excess profits. Uh, there's also out of scope m and meaning that, that, that incentives can still be offered for them. Uh, and the paper, which I mentioned earlier, makes the point about possible use of, of other non-tax instruments. But certainly there is pressure to remove tax incentives affecting excess profits. 
Um, and so the paper could mention that, 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 that it would un uh, unwind some of those benefits, particularly for things like intellectual property schemes, which, which, which generally um, um, give rise to, to large residual profits that, that could be sheltered by the incentive. The last point to make is the impact on tax incentive over non-excess profits. And I think Professor English also mentioned this, that given the, the more generous substance-based carve-out and the high thresholds, uh, it is potential that that, for, for, that source countries will continue to be able to offer incentives over non-excess profits. And so that makes the design of these incentives important. And, and certainly the paper hints at cost-based incentives in the Indian context of accelerated depreciation. But again, um, some key takeaways on the impact of incentives going forward uh, would also be worth including in the paper. So I'll leave it at there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corey. And, and now I would like to, to go back to Suranjali. Uh, I, I wonder if you would like to, to respond to some of the comments and you have three minutes to do that. Please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Um, I really want to thank uh, Professor Joachim and Corey for their comments. I think uh, they were very useful and very extensive. I do understand that there was a shortcoming in my approach that, uh, you know, I, I sort of broached the subject of domestic minimum taxes and never really went there. Um, I think uh, perhaps if we're talking about the pillar two reforms now, uh, it means that there have been shortcomings with uh, the domestic minimum taxes and uh, perhaps paper needs to expand on that. Um, I also uh, want to re respond to the point made by uh, Professor Wakam, which is on the administrative capacity. So, uh, you know, with pillar one and two, and uh, pillar one and two have spoken about the uh, stress on the administrative capacity, especially in developing countries, to implement such a complicated reform. And uh, perhaps that is another element that uh, you know I could add. I was trying to sort of limit myself on on all the moving parts that I bring into the paper, but I think I can't overlook uh, each of the ones that are suggested. Um, rest of the comments are very detailed, and uh, I'm going to make all these changes to my paper. I'm not going to uh, respond to each of them. But thank you once again. I, I noticed that Frederick had a question or a comment. Um, in the chat box. So, Frederick, uh, would you like to ask your question? Uh, no, I was just just thinking about um, because you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you think uh, pillar two might be not implemented by all residents countries because there would be an incentive to compete um, based on the experience with CFC rules and. Uh, it seems logical to me that the incentive would be there, but at the same time, it seems to me that the purpose of doing um, all these discussion at the level of the inclusive framework is specifically to create some more commitment by, by countries than what was attempted before. So um, I, I'm not sure that, that just based on that, that countries uh, did not not all countries did use CFC rules. We could uh, really infer that um, the same would happen to to the minimum tax because it's a different kind of dynamic at the international at the international level. I think that's a fairly valid point, Frederick. That's uh, you know part of the paper. So I talk about uh, you know how CFC rules have been implemented in EU. They look very different. They apply to very different sort of base of tax of incomes. So um, you can infer in some ways what might happen with the income inclusion rule, but then it's again speculative, although it's already there in the paper, but thanks for that comment, uh, extremely useful. Thank you very much for that. And there is another question from the floor. So Jeroen Lammers, could you like to submit your question? Uh, yes, Over sure. to you, please. Thank you so much. Hi, Suren Jali. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, very, very interesting. My question um, that I've also written in the chat is, a lot of people talk about uh, Pillar 2 as a minimum tax, but what if it also should act as a maximum tax? So what if bigger advanced economies bring down their rate? Maybe not all the way to the 15% mark, but uh, at least bring it down a little bit, because I as I remember, IMF once said that cost of capital of uh, investing in uh, developing countries is about one and, one and a half to two times higher than in advanced economies. 
if advanced economies bring down their taxes, then the tax differential would uh, disappear or disappear in part. Uh, would that have effect on FDA, FDI inflow into developing countries? Yeah, that's a fair question, a good one uh, at that as well. So I think uh, it all depends on where the tax rates are at the moment. Um, of course, there is an option to set the maximum, uh, to lower the maximum as well. And that uh, changes and shifts the FDI dynamics. So if, if uh, there is a possibility to tax back as well as to lower tax rates within a domestic jurisdiction, uh, it changes the metrics that the investor evaluates uh, the tax system. So, um, yeah, that's another uh, in response that needs to be sort of factored in. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that. One, one final comment, if I may. I think that one fundamental assumption that the minimum taxation is, is making is that the relevant countries will have an incentive to enforce it, to enforce the minimum taxation. And I wonder if that assumption is correct. If you take a look at uh, enforcement patterns uh, over the last uh, 40 years, what I can see is that in the 60s, I mean, G20 countries uh, fundamentally enforce their international tax system um, in disputes involving non-G20 hubs, such as the Netherlands, Switzerland, etc. But since the 70s onwards, what I can see is that G20 countries have fundamentally focused its enforcement effort towards other G20 countries. For example, Germany versus France, rather than Germany versus uh, BBI. So the, the big question, I'm not expecting Soranjali you to answer it uh, today, but is to what extent th this crucial assumption is correct or not? Probably it's a question for, for another global tax symposium. Uh, uh, what I would like just to, to add is, uh, a big thank you to Suranjali Tandem, Professor Suranjali Tandem from the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy in India, Professor Joachim English, University of Munster, Germany, and Corey Hillier uh, uh, from the IMF. Thank you so much. And uh, over to you, Irma. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see that there is a final question in the chat, but this could be also answered perhaps uh, it's kind of a comment. So. Uh, in the local property tax reform, uh, they set a minimum tax rate and a maximum tax rate for property tax to avoid the political pressure from the public. So thank you so much. We will start with the paper number four, and that is from Stephen Daly. Um, and the topic is about trust, tax administration, and state aid. And thereafter, we will have two discussions. And first is Hans Kripno, professor at Leiden University and also at Tilburg University. And we will have David Hummel, who is professor in Leisberg University and also legal secretary at the European Court of Justice. Unfortunately, uh, Advocate General Cocot was having a preliminary uh, hearing today, so he could not be with us, but he said David Hummel will be the person who will also solve all these problems. So no pressure, but we will be okay. Uh, and thank you also everyone for the other interesting presentation. So now I give the word to Steve, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Irma. And I'm going to copy uh, Rex Aronson's salutation, say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night to everybody that's in attendance. It's really, really fantastic. I'm really looking forward to all of the comments that I'm going to receive on my presentation, which I've entitled Trust, Tax Administration and State Aid. And you'll have to forgive me a second as I try and share my screen. I've been on research leave this term, so I'm kind of out of the habit of using Zoom and everything. So let's let's try this. Share my screen, share my slides. Okay, hopefully everybody should see my slides now. Perfect stuff, thank you very much. Okay, here we go. So the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna give you a bit of uh, background to this paper and what was the inspiration. Hopefully I'm onto the next slide now. Could I get a thumbs up from somebody? Okay, thank you very much. As I said, really, really rusty on this. Okay, so. State aid tax rulings investigations, they began in 2013, and we've had a series of decisions since then. At the heart of these cases have been tax rulings, they're just agreements between taxpayers and taxpayer, taxpayers and tax authorities, tax rulings that have been issued by tax authorities to multinational entities. 
The concern is that these tax rulings gave unduly, unduly favorable treatment to certain taxpayers. Okay, and therefore, unduly favorable treatment equals state aid. So uh, failure to uh, properly apply the rules to taxpayers results in selective treatment of those taxpayers and therefore state aid. Now, the arguments in the cases and in the literature as well have focused on that premise, this idea that a misapplication of the rules amends to state aid. And I've had concerns about that premise, that it should be as strict as saying that a misapplication can amount to state aid. I have a series of reasons for this, but principally it, it feels intuitively wrong that we would make no distinction between innocent mistakes on the part of tax authorities as opposed to deliberate mistakes on the part of tax authorities. But at the same time, I think that there are serious concerns which underpinned the initial decisions that the Commission issued against tax authorities and member states. If we looked at Apple and Ireland, the suggestion was that Ireland reverse engineered a particular result in its tax ruling. If we look at Amazon and Luxembourg, we can see that there was, to put it lightly, insufficient documentation to support the tax ruling that was issued, and it was all done in a very, very quick timeline. So straddling between those two concerns, on the one hand, this idea that the rules shouldn't be overly strict, but on the other hand, that there needs to be some means of holding tax authorities to account when they issue tax rulings to taxpayers. I adopted an immediate position in the paper that was published this year in the Law Quarterly Review. Essentially, the median position was not all misapplications of the underlying tax code should amount to state aid, but likewise, not all bad tax administration should be immune from state aid. If you want a formula, it will say underpaid tax plus legally improper administration equals state aid. I've got a picture on the left hand side of what looks like a girl being rejected by a little boy. That was, that's just a little joke there because that paper that eventually was published this year went round and round several journals, eventually being rejected by a handful before finally finding its place in the Law Quarterly Review in 2021 and tangentially getting me my promotion this year also. The problem with simply looking at state aid investigations, however, is that they're very, very complex. They're very time consuming and they're very resource intensive. So whilst state aid investigations can be one means of holding tax authorities to account, I don't think that there is sufficient means of doing so. So this paper, Trust Tax Administration and State Aid, it seeks to supplement my earlier paper by proposing a broader framework for holding tax authorities to account. And the paper proposes that we need intelligent accountability over tax ruling practices at the EU level. Now that last statement should mean next to nothing to those of you that are listening today, unless you've actually read the paper. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and unpack all of that. There's a lot of heavy lifting that needs to be done in this presentation because the paper itself is admittedly quite dense. Part one of the paper is gonna explain the utility of trustworthiness, why I talk about trustworthiness in the paper, and also define and defend intelligent accountability. I've already issued this idea that I wanna propose intelligent accountability, but I haven't explained at all what intelligent accountability is. That's what part one of the paper is gonna do. Part two of the paper then seeks to apply this intelligent accountability framework to tax rulings granted to large taxpayers. And we'll get to that in due course. Okay, the utility of trustworthiness. Let me start with my proposition. The failure to collect taxes due by multinationals is an issue in which the Commission, as guardian of the treaties, has an interest. We have several reasons to support this proposition. There are macroeconomic and budgetary consequences of the for, um, which follow from the failure to collect taxes due. So from a macroeconomic perspective, we don't want to have countries relying upon lax tax administration as a means of attracting foreign direct investment. It will have budgetary consequences for other member states if one tax authority grants an unduly favorable tax ruling to a taxpayer, because that will strip away the overall tax base. So it will reduce the overall tax base if one country is offering a favorable ruling. 
because there's going to be less tax paid generally across member states then. And finally, failure to collect taxes due from multinationals creates unjustified economic distortions and therefore possible state aid in the European Union. So for those reasons, I say it's important that the Commission knows whether it can trust tax authorities to actually do their job to collect taxes due from multinationals. So my question then is, can we trust that tax authorities faithfully collect all taxes due from multinationals? Well, maybe that is slightly the wrong question and I'll explain why. Honora O'Neill, a philosopher who is an expert on the topic of trust, has suggested that we place less weight upon the issue of trust itself and focus more on trustworthiness. Trustworthiness is about whether somebody lives up to their commitments and is competent in completing the assigned tasks. Uh, if we think about a doctor, a doctor will be competent if they're good at diagnosing particular illnesses and so on. A trustworthy doctor then is one that is competent in that respect. But given one of the norms of competence to be expected of a tax authority is that of carrying out the task of collecting taxes objectively, an untrustworthy one is one which does not collect all taxes dispassionately and thus discriminates between taxpayers. So the Commission should be able to sensibly place its trust in those tax authorities that are trustworthy and refrain from doing so in respect of those that are untrustworthy. A tax, where a tax authority that tends to hand out unduly favourable tax rulings is an, is an untrustworthy tax authority and then vice versa. The question accordingly should be, how can the Commission gather evidence as to trustworthiness, which can then form the basis of placing trust sensibly in tax authorities? And the importance of this is that it'll actually, it'll have operational effects. So the, the evidence will allow the Commission to allocate its resources so that it investigates more those less trustworthy tax authorities and uh, investigates less those trustworthy tax authorities. Now, how can you gather evidence as to trustworthiness? Well, the intensive state aid investigations are one means of doing so, and I've already explained that, but I've also explained that it's very, very resource intensive, time consuming and complex. Intelligent accountability is another means of generating that evidence as to trustworthiness. And intelligent accountability is a model proposed by a philosopher, Ornora O'Neill, who I've got on the left-hand side of the slide. So what is intelligent accountability? Well, intelligent accountability follows the usual accountability models. You know, you answer all those questions that I've got up on the slide there, but it is intelligent. It's intelligent because it focuses on what is important when we design an accountability framework. What is important? Well, that expertise can be harnessed so that the principal, the commission in this instance, can be properly informed. It'll, it will gather evidence as to trustworthiness, and it is one which is antithetical to managerialism. It's not just about micromanaging, it's about generating evidence as to trustworthiness. And an intelligent accountability framework, in turn, requires three particular things that we have informed and independent monitoring of performance, which is then intelligibly communicated to the relevant audience. Informed here means that we've got expertise. Independent means we got free from bias. And intelligible communication means that the communication of the account of performance is understandable by the relevant audience here, the commission. Now, hopefully, that's enough of intelligent accountability explained, so I can move on to part two of the paper. Part two of the paper then seeks to apply this intelligent accountability framework to tax rulings granted to large taxpayers. There's three particular things that part two does. It looks at two initiatives, those initiatives being tax transparency and internal accountability, and sees whether or to what extent either are appropriate for generating intelligent accountability and the final bit that the paper does is it tries to set out the role of the commission in implementing intelligent accountability. So moving on to my first initiative I want to 
analyzed. And this is tax transparency, the idea that we should publish to the public tax rulings. So can the publication of tax rulings generate intelligent account fraud? Maybe, maybe. Putting the argument at its best, I'd write it something like this. Taxpayers and tax authorities would be more cautious in ensuring that all taxes due are paid by virtue of the publication of tax rulings, as issues of impropriety could be highlighted by NGOs, experts, other taxpayers, other public bodies, and the public more generally, who could then apply pressure to the taxpayers and the tax authorities. That's putting the argument as most charitable. But that makes some quite significant assumptions. Public transparency is really only useful for the purposes of, ev of uh, generating evidence of commitment and competence if the information is accessible and intelligible. Is the publication of a tax ruling going to mean that the information is generally accessible to the public? Well, you need to have more than simply the result of the ruling. You know, the result of the ruling might be company X is not resident in this state. You need all of the background information also. So you need to see the application and also the discussions that came beforehand. But that's not an insurmountable problem. What's probably more significant as an issue is the, uh, is the intelligibility of that information once it is transmitted to the public. So does the public have the expertise to understand and assess the relevant information? Does the public have the expertise to understand what's actually going on in a tax ruling? I would say as a proposition, generally the public is not going to be very good at understanding this, but there will be members of the public and there will be elements of civil society which will have that relevant expertise. So we'd be relying very heavily upon those members of the public who have the relevant expertise to uh, to engage quite significantly in this accountability exercise if we really thought that the publication of tax rulings could bring about intelligent accountability. What about trying to harness the existing mechanisms of accountability that exist within member states? So different member states are constituted differently and the framework of government is going to be different also. But what you're going to find in terms of commonality is that all member states will have some means of holding their tax authorities to account. So what I suggest is maybe we can harness the existing internal accountability mechanisms within member states. And we can we can use them to generate evidence as to trustworthiness that can be intelligibly communicated to the Commission and the Commission can then act accordingly. In the paper, I engage in a lengthy study of the Finnish tax system to look at what the mechanisms for accountability are there. And uh, the Finnish tax system is very, very interesting because within the tax administration, there is a body called VOVA. And VOVA is independent of the tax collecting units within the tax administration. And VOVA is a team of tax experts. And these tax experts have the ability to challenge tax rulings that have been issued by the tax collecting units. They also have access to all relevant information in respect of tax rulings and other aspects of tax administration generally. So VOVA then is informed. VOVA is also independent of the tax collecting units within the tax administration both institutionally, because they're separate offices, but also functionally. Functionally, we can see that they do act independently just purely by looking at the numbers in terms of how many challenges are issued every year against the tax collecting units by VOVA, and how many uh, times VOVA is actually successful in those challenges. Now, can VOVA then intelligibly communicate evidences of trustworthiness to the Commission? Well, yes, VOVA issues reports every year, annual reports, setting out what it has done and setting out some of the aspects of tax collection that it has challenged during the year and how tax collecting units have gotten on. There's also intelligible communication indirectly through the provision of judgments in the court. So cases are taken by VOVA against the tax collecting units. 
they're litigated all the way through the courts and the courts then hand out judgment. So it's an indirect form of communicating information. So that's my bit of background. Now I need to get into what I wanna talk about, what I'm actually gonna propose then. So I'm not gonna simply ignore the idea of public transparency. I think that there is something in there. But for public transparency or transparency generally to be truly useful, there needs to be some means of specifically engaging those persons with relevant expertise. So what I suggest is a tweaking of the code of conduct for business taxation, such that member states are encouraged to publish anonymized tax rulings supplied to large taxpayers and to create a channel for the public to provide feedback to the commission. So the public can then get its hands on these tax rulings, anonymized tax rulings, and the relevant expertise within the public, so from the members of civil society that actually have this relevant expertise, that can get funneled back up through to the commission. Now that's not going to be perfect. So what I also suggest is that a sample of rulings is scrutinized by the commission and the expert code of conduct group. And the code's peer review process could also be engaged so that member states could peer review each other's tax rulings. Again, a sample of those tax rulings. Where member states tax rulings are evaluated as falling below the required standards, so where it's deemed, or where it's thought that the member states are not properly applying their own tax rules, pressure can be applied to the tax authority for it to either explain itself, begin auditing or proceedings to capture the uncollected taxes, or change course for the future. And the beauty of of this proposal is that where it is deemed that a favorable ruling raises a state aid issue, then the Commission will always have the power in the background to bring infringement proceedings. So that's why I suggest in terms of transparency over tax rulings. But in terms of harnessing the internal accountability mechanisms, I think what we ought to do is utilize the European semester. What, what can be done through the European semester is that member states will be required in the first instance to explain to the commission whether it has mechanisms in place, in place to produce intelligent accountability. So like the Finnish system, is there some means of generating evidence as to trustworthiness which can then be communicated to the commission? What I propose also is that the commission could establish a tax administration group similar to the code of conduct group in respect of the code of conduct for business taxation formed of tax administration experts from member state tax authorities, businesses, and civil society. That would be the first iteration within the European semester. Thereafter, you could go for broad recommendations, which set out the framework of intelligent accountability. Again, that's informed and independent monitoring of performance, which is intelligibly communicated. And that can be implemented and monitored within the European semester. And we can have learnings from previous iterations in addition to comparative analysis, looking at what different member states do. Thereafter, in a later cycle of the European semester, we can have more intensive peer review of specific aspects of internal accountability over tax rulings, along with discrete country-specific recommendations to member states where they're deemed to have failed to make necessary improvements and to buy into the process. So if I'm just to sum up what I've said, I have tried to highlight the relevance of trustworthiness. I've propounded intelligent accountability as a framework for accountability. I've proposed that there should be supranational monitoring of tax authorities. And I've also made concrete proposals on transparency and harnessing intelligent accountability. So thank you very much everybody for listening. And I'm very much looking forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. I see you did perfect on time, so you have your 20 minutes allocated. Um, and now we will have two discussions, but please feel free to ask the questions in the chat. What I have to say really this, uh, this morning has been really productive. There is a lot of papers that give a lot of food for thought. So please also use that this opportunity to, to share your thoughts in the, in the chat. Uh, I will give first the word to Hans Kripno, and then after I will go to David uh, Hummel. Thank you so much, Hans. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Emma. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your, your, your nice, uh, very, very fine uh, paper. Uh, indeed, you introduce a, a fascinating, broader framework on, on state aid. 
and it's truly totally multidisciplinary. So I, I like that very much. Uh, There's a very fine, elaborate line of, of reasoning. The interesting thing is that uh, we started this morning uh, in the discussion with a comment uh, by Thomas Rickson uh, that was all about power and you deal with this power indeed. It's, it's about accountability. So it, it's, it's holding power to, to account. And, and the point is that, uh, as you state at the beginning of your paper, that the European Commission has not uh, sufficient resources. It's a very small enforcement agency. So are there any alternative methods of controls? Uh, and you look uh, indeed for uh, other kind of accountability mechanism. So the point is, how can you resource, outsource the supervision on compliance with EU law? So which accountability mechanism is capable of doing the trick? And you go for intelligent, intelligent accountability. I think it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, and the important thing is that you use, uh, you, you introduce the, the, the point of, of uh, the issue of trust, because as you indeed, uh, I think, rightly argue that uh, absolute perfect control is, is, is impossible. And that also means that perfect accountability is simply not for sale. So there's always an element of risk of uncertainty involved. And then, of course, the question will be, how do you cope? How does the European Commission cope with this uncertainty? And here, exactly here, uh, trust enters the scene because uh, trust implies making oneself vulnerable since there's room for action and this action, room for action entails risk of or uncertainty. And that's exactly what you're pointing at, that when the European Commission outsources like a real principle to some other uh, institution, uh, the agent, uh, the, 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 the power of investigating, then there is inevitably some kind of discretion for this agent. So the European Commission will never be perfectly sure how this discretion will be used. And that's why you need the, to trust this, the agent. But then you, of course, you, 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 you take an, a very an important step to, uh, following uh, Honora O'Neill, I think uh, rightly so again, that <clears throat> trust is, is not that interesting because trust in the end, it's, you, you place trust in somebody, in some organization, in some institution, that is reliable, that is trustworthy. So trust requires trustworthiness or reliability. Uh, and what you also emphasize rightly again, I would say that the issue of trust is also normative in the sense of satisfying norms such as honesty and reliability. So trustworthiness entails one's competence to perform what one is trusted to do but also reliance that someone is motivated to perform the actions required. So that goes, of, of course, about this delegated uh, organization such as the, the Norwegian uh, VOVA. I will come back to that point. Um, so you go for intelligent accountability, you elaborated on that. And I think that, that that's quite a, quite a nice application uh, in, in the, the context of the, the state aid uh, regime in the state aid issue. Um, and in the end, I, I think if you have uh, all kinds of domestic FOVAs, uh, then uh, this, 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 or this, this independent objective organization in, in Norway, if you, every country, every member state has such a, a VOVA, then you have kind of, of network of domestic accountability mechanisms, which would check the member states uh, power or, or, or the, the non-compliance of the, 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 the member states. So I, I think that's a very nice line of, of reasoning and a very fine uh, argument. Um, but I have one general question um, and, and some more detailed questions with regard to the application. As, as, as you argue, uh, trustworthiness is about competence and motivation. Uh, the competence to uh, or capability to perform something, but also the willingness to to perform. So the motivation, and I, I really wonder how exactly can you assess in your proposals this 
motivational element because of course you can see the way these uh, domestic fova so to say i won't pronounce it in, in norwegian language because the, that the, sorry yeah norwegian language that's not my, my strongest uh, language uh, for the moment i i try to learn it but i i have to to pass this on to other speakers but how do you uh, um how do you let's say as a european commission from the point of the european commission how could you assess this 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 this, this motivation this motivational aspect because the competence aspect that is really covered i would say in your proposals um and then with regard sorry it's the finnish uh, tax recipients uh, legal service so that's even a, a more difficult language um I, I perhaps and that's just a general suggestion perhaps you could compare it somehow with uh, the u.s taxpayers advocate that's also an independent uh, organ uh, service organization i don't know much about that but perhaps that would be nice to compare but now my more detailed questions uh ideally the member states will create their own domestic control mechanism su such a vova but but will they because it will could be very costly for them uh, you need time and resources and uh, of course this independent institution would be more trustworthy by but it might of course be met with resistance from those dom domestic tax administration because it's 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 it uh, leaves them less uh, discretion, uh, and and perhaps they don't like this this kind of control. Um, so will they really introduce such a trustworthy institution? Will other states uh, follow the lead uh, set by uh, by 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 Finland? Um, and then the next question would be, but how will the European Commission supervise all these, um, these, 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 these FOVAs? Will that not also be quite costly? So will that, will the, will there not be additional costs? Um, and then it could also be that member states will respond strategically they might think that European Commission has not sufficient resources for many intrusive investigations, as you say, of course, because it's, it's a small enforcement agency. So why wouldn't they opt for something like just playing the audit lottery, just going on and, and well, just take this risk? Um, and if they do so, um, well, in the end, will there not be let's say uh result some spiral of distrust of mistrust and will supervision not become even more costly so just view more detailed questions but i, I again i i like your paper really really uh, very much thank you thank you so much hans and especially you have worked in trust tax administration for a long time, so your views are definitely very valuable in this uh, case. So uh, let me give the word to David Hummel. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, bonjour à tous. Hello to everybody. Um, first of all, I have to transmit greetings from Madame Cocot. She's really sorry that she is not able to uh, participate, but uh, you can imagine that her agenda, agenda is very uh, well filled. Believe me, you don't want to sweat. And uh, thanks a lot, Stephen, for the presentation of the paper and for the content of the paper. And in my point of view, that are a lot of very interesting ideas in regard of a very actual topic. And in my point of view, and I guess you will agree, uh, this topic is still not solved and we have, uh, have a lot of time, need uh, time to solve it and I'm not sure if there's a solution, a right one or a perfect solution for this uh, problem. Before I start, um, I, uh, with my short comment, I will make or I have to make a little disclaimer. Um, how mentioned before, I'm referendaire or legal secretary, I believe in English, uh, of the European Court of Ta uh, Justice. And therefore, I'm involved in a lot of the state aid cases in the last time. But I'm also professor of the University of Leipzig in Germany and uh, with a special interest or hobby in tax law and state aid law. And 
everything what I'm saying here in this uh, conference, I'm saying as a university professor, uh, that's uh, important. Uh, please don't cite me as the court has said or something like that. Um, and first of all, um, I'm sure you are right. Um, the introduction of an element of trust could help to solve one of the main problems of the state aid cases, especially in regarding of tax rulings or more general in regard of tax law. And in so far, your ideas and your perspective in the paper are really interesting for me. Maybe I'm not sure if it is really helpful to categorize uh, the different member states or the financial administration of different uh, member states in more or less trustful administration. Uh, for example, Luxembourg, a fast administration is in my eyes not per se untrustworthy. And uh, I guess you mentioned in your paper the, the UK uh, administration, which needs uh, 24 months for a tax ruling in uh, transfer prices. Um, yeah, to be honest, uh, 24 months for a tax ruling, forgot a little bit the sense of a tax ruling, and it's not so useful for the taxpayer. Uh, and so far, maybe it's it's not the uh, worst thing if an uh, administration is working fast, uh, but uh, the administration should work correct. That uh, we agree, I guess. And uh, at the moment, and that's a little bit uh, now we come to my concerns, it looks like that uh, there is in the EU a tendency, and maybe in the Commission too, to mistrust some member states uh, more than other ones. And in my point of view, that's not good for a union, a union of words, or union of law. And um, maybe we don't should uh, put this problem also on the tax law or the state aid law. Um, and in the end, I would say I share the most of your cons concerns reg uh, regarding the ability uh, of the Commission to check all the tax rulings. And um, you try to solve it with, with this um, um, trust element uh, to, to help the Commission to, to control. And I would go a step further, um, uh, more further, um, and pose the question if it's really the function of the Commission to check all tax rulings. And uh, to be honest, I'm not convinced that the policy of the Commission to focus on tax rulings or to focus on tax law of the member state is the right one and in line with the EU law. The main problem in this point is, in my point of view, that the EU law lets the member states the competence for tax law. And we can see after the court, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, developed the justification of the restriction of the fundamental freedoms. We see more and more cases in which the Commission now try to check the national tax law of the member states, not with the fundamental freedoms, now with the tax uh, state aid rules. And in some point, I can understand the Commission. Um, because uh, the member states, some more than the other one, but uh, the member states are sometimes very innovative to circumvent the state aid rules with the tax law. And this uh, is a function or the, the uh, duty of the Commission to prevent this. The famous Gibraltar case is a good example for this one. But uh, is every strange tax law or every strange, maybe wrong uh, tax ruling, a circumvention of the state aid rules. I'm not sure. Should every wrong tax notice concerning an enterprise be a state aid? I'm very doubtful about such a result. And uh, if we would consider that every time that an enterprise which is paying less taxes as it has to pay applying the law correctly, if each time this would be a state aid, then the commission would be in the end, uh, which is responsible to control state aids, will be in the end and become a super financial administration. And that is not the function of the commission. I guess you agree. And um, the treaties uh, don't mention this function of the commission too. And so far, um, it's a, it's a um, uh, yeah, fundamental problem, I would say. And um, in the end, it leads to, to next, the next problem, and we see it now in the cases of the court. If you would consider that every time that an enterprise paying less taxes as it has to pay, applying the correct 
national tax law, if this would be a state aid, in the end, the court of justice has to decide what is a correct application of the national tax law. And to be honest, that's not possible for the court. And that's not the function of the court. The court has to apply the EU law, has to interpret the EU law, not the national law. And uh, in so far, that's a huge difference in my point of view to check EU law or to check national tax law. And uh, you see, I'm really concerned uh, by the latest, latest developments in regard of tax law or in state aid law. And here, and now we come together, I guess, uh, the element of trust, uh, I guess, is helpful. But I, I will um, modify it a little bit and say, maybe it's a good idea to say that in a, Euro a European Union, we trust primarily that each member state will collect the correct taxes by its own interest. Even Ireland or Luxembourg has an own interest to collect the right taxes. And maybe we can say that in the European Union, we can trust that each financial administration, which is bound by law normally, uh, will normally not breach the national law. And this means that a mistake itself, you mentioned it rightly, which leads to a lower tax is not per se in state aid. And maybe we can trust that each member state has its own elements to detect these mistakes like court of auditors or this uh, NOBA or this organization. But uh, each member state has a different uh, system, I guess. And um, each member state has uh, elements to punish an illegal taxation in favor of one special taxpayers. And that's, in my point of view, it's more the problem to treat taxpayers differently by the same law. It's not a problem of state aid. It's also a problem of state aid, but it's uh, not, uh, um, it makes no difference if it's an enterprise or it's not an enterprise. The different treatment of the taxpayers in favor of one special taxpayers from the financial administration is a problem per se, but primarily in my point of view, a problem of the member state. And maybe we can trust that this problem will be solved with the methods or elements of this member state. And then if we can trust in so far, and I would say we can, uh, the commission can focus itself to the cases in which the member states really try to circumvent the state aid rules. And um, then they have an obligation to check these cases. Not every strange tax law, not every maybe strange uh, tax ruling. Um, and to make it very clear, and um, yeah, that's a really a concern of mine, not every tax law which the commission does not understand is, for example, the Hungarian and Polish turnover-based progressive tax uh, systems for special sectors with a progressive tax rate is a circumvention of state aid rules. And that, uh, got uh, thanks, the court has confirmed in the last year very clearly and the, what I was a little bit uh, very sorry about it, the main argument of the commission in the whole process for, in front of the court was always that Dutch and Polish and Hungarian tax law make no sense. And that's not up to the commission to decide which national tax law makes sense or make no sense. And it's, all, it's not up to uh, the commission to decide if the tax ruling or maybe later in tax notice is correct. It's up to the commission to prevent the circumvention of the state aid rules, but that's a different. And um, we see the problems um, now in the, we got a case, um, the uh, preliminary ruling is, or the request of the preliminary ruling is, is published, I guess. And so far, I can talk about it. It's the first and last uh, uh, case from Gibraltar's tax court, shortly before the delay of, uh, the, of, of the Brexit uh, is gone. And in this case, it shows the problem very well, because the commission made a decision about a special article of the, the um, corporate tax uh, law of Gibraltar, and an enterprise wants to have a special tax relief for, of another provision. And now the tax administration was not not sure what they have to do and asked the commission, can we apply the national law to this uh, enterprise, to this taxpayer? 
And um, to be honest, uh, that's not the, uh, the function of the commission to allow or uh, to forbid uh, the tax administration to make a tax notice. And in so far, it's, uh, it's difficult. I don't know. I, I know that I don't have the right solution, but maybe a little bit more trust in the member states, in the administration of the member states uh, will help to to make it different between the circumvention of stated rules and to the maybe strange application of national tax law. Okay, that's uh, all of me. Thanks a lot for your paper. Thank you so much, David. I think that uh, I will give the word first to Steve uh, to reply to these comments. Please feel free to uh, raise your hand or ask the questions in the chat. Uh, Steve? Yes, thank you very much, David and Hans. Those are really, really excellent comments. There's a lot for me to think about. And I don't have answers to all of the questions. So rather than wasting everybody's time, I'm just going to try and deal with the ones that I can answer. So Hans, you talked about, you know, what happens if member states are just recalcitrant? They're, they're reluctant to actually engage with the process. Um, and why would they want to actually give over power why would they want to institute mechanisms of accountability which would reduce their discretion and so on? So in response, I've got a couple of points that I make. The first is just that these accountability mechanisms will exist in one way or another within member states. They might be uh, political rather than legal controls and so on, but there, there'll be something. So to that extent, the issue about whether they'll engage with the process is already dealt with in terms of the necessary conditions. I'd also point out, though, that member states have started making moves in light of the Commission's in, uh, state investigations to actually shore up their accountability mechanisms, principally in respect of tax rulings. So we see places like Luxembourg, it's no longer just one person issues a tax ruling, but actually there's a board in, in, that, that oversees it and everything, you know. And lots of tax authorities have also gone in that direction. We've got similar steps in, in the Netherlands. So states have kind of already, it's already, they're already making moves this way. But fundamentally, if the commission needs a, a, like a carrot and stick approach, it does have state aid investigations that it can use. So if member states are not willing to buy into the process, then the commission can resort to using state aid powers. And those are extensive and those will, those will be really, really invasive in respect of member states. Claudio Radielli, uh, EU law professor years ago, wrote about the relationship between the code of conduct for business taxation and state aid investigations. Back in 2003, he wrote about this, that as soon as states stopped engaging with the code of conduct for business taxation, the commission started going after them with state aid investigations. So the powers are there, they're, they're, reliant, they're sitting there in the background. How will the commission supervise these bulbas? Is that not going to impose additional costs? Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I can't get away from that. But what I've, what I've suggested is that the burden is shared with this tax administration group. And the commission has already made steps in different aspects of tax to set up groups that can assist the commission in this respect. So whilst there's gonna be additional costs, I'd hope that the costs can be shared with this tax administration group. Uh, David, I think a lot of what you uh, mentioned chimes very much with my concerns and my motivations which is essentially about us trying to figure out where the line is between state aid and, and domestic law. Um, and you're right, different treatment between taxpayers is fundamentally problematic, but it's not necessarily an issue of EU law, I, I entirely agree. And so what I've tried in my law quarterly review paper and in this paper to do is to try to make it clear where that line should be. And if the answer is that we'd like the commission to have more trust in tax administrations, Perhaps this evidence generating process actually gives the commission the information that it needs so that it can be able to trust tax administrations more. Um, so thank you very much again for those comments and those questions. There's so much in there that I need to think about and I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Um, I'll be happy to answer any other questions from the audience. Yes, please. If you have a question, just raise your hand. Uh, in the meantime, I have uh, two comments. I, I do I do think that the part of intelligent intelligence account intelligent accountability is very interesting. And I do think that the work that you have done on how to improve this from the European Commission, but I was also wondering 
whether this trust is also and trustworthiness is not only from the European Commission towards the member states, but also within the EU institutions. Because what you see since one year ago with the creation of the fixed committee in the EU Parliament is that there is more claim from the EU Parliament than this, the fixed committee as representative of EU member states from the Parliament, whether there will be also more a role for them in the code of conduct and in the standard of good tax governance. That's the first question I have for you. And the second one that I have is whether you see this intelligent accountability also being used for something like is create, creating a lot of discussion right now that is the public country by country reporting. Whether you will see it also as, as kind of a, a, a method to say, well, if you want to be transparent, then the multinationals are transparent in terms of the public country by country reporting. But what does it mean? So I, I was wondering, I just want to take you a little further and see whether in these discussions you have already uh, think about this intelligent accountability and how we'll work to solve the tensions between AU institutions and the claim of the EU Parliament that they have a role in this uh, direct taxation and also the claim of the and the use of for the public country by country reporting. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Mosquera. Those are really, really great uh, questions because it's what I like to do when I ask questions as well, is to push beyond what the paper has already suggested. So in, in terms of your first question about institutions within the EU, I, I'd have to think more about that. I certainly think that the framework that's in this paper could be applied more generally in respect of those relationships between different institutions. But I, don't, I, I couldn't quite uh, articulate right now how I would envisage that operating. But I think that there is definitely something in there in terms of sharing that burden and having a more collaborative approach. And fundamentally, the issue that I'm concerned with is good tax governance. How do we ensure good tax governance generally? So moving on to your uh, second question, the answer is yes, I have thought about how this can have a more general operation. And again, uh, full disclosure, this paper has been substantially revised in the last couple of months, and it's, it's forthcoming in the Modern Law Review whenever that will come out in the next year or two. And I've, I've slightly rejigged the emphasis, so I focus more on the accountability bit rather than on the, the trust side of things. And tax rulings are just one thing that could go into that intelligent accountability framework. And other aspects that I was thinking about, cooperative compliance, tax guidance, all these sorts of things that tax administrations get up to. I thought that they could also be assessed within this similar kind of framework. And there's no reason for thinking that uh, public country by country reporting couldn't also fit within this. So yes, whilst narrowly I'm concerned with tax rulings in this paper, that's just one aspect of tax administration and transparency that could be covered within an intelligent accountability framework. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two questions, so I will give first uh, Frederick and Hans will ask the questions and then I will give uh, time to Steve to react to it. Frederick, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Steve, for your interesting presentation. Um, I wanted to ask you whether um, you could qualify, like how would you qualify the approach that the Euro Com European Commission is taking right now with regards to the state aid investigations? I'm wondering whether or not actually already the Commission has some idea about which um, uh, which administrations it thinks trustworthy or not, um, or would you say there is a, um, a, an, a basis that it applies across the board and catches all kinds of tax rulings um, that uh, that it deems contrary to um, to member states national law. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if that kind of selectivity is not maybe already there in the approach. But I'm um, since I don't know this topic so well, I would be curious to hear, hear your your opinion on this. Let me I give the word to Hans, and I see also another hand, Federica. Uh, so I will give first to Hans, and then after to Federica. Sorry, I was uh, still muted. Uh, it's just a very brief uh, remark. Uh, Ilmar, you pointed uh, at the uh, trust relationships within the European Union institutions. 
And uh, in the same way, I think already David pointed at trust, trustworthiness relationships between member states. Uh, and that reminds me that Judith Friedman has, uh, has written a paper on, on tax and trust in, in this book, and it's on her SSRN paper. You have it, I suppose. <laughs> no, there are, so, there are many, many more trust relationships. So we expect many future articles uh, written by you on this subject, uh, Dave, uh, Steve. Thank you, Hans. I will give the word to Fred Federica. Please, Federica, uh, perhaps introduce yourself if yeah. people do not know you. Yeah, so good morning, everybody, or good afternoon or good evening. I'm Federica Casano, PhD candidate in tax at Leiden University. And um, I would like very much to connect this topic with this new initiative uh, from the Code of Conduct Group to reform its mandate and increase transparency. And I was wondering how you would interpret this initiative. Like, is this something that shows that they want to have trust and they will, um, because they believe also in the use that the public could uh, do of any further information about the work of the Code of Conduct, or is actually like an answer to the fact that there is no trust um, from the public or maybe they even, even the European Parliament to the Code of Conduct. So it is like a, just a way for the Code of Conduct to say, okay, we, we really need to do something because everybody's criticizing us. So we need to be more transparent. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. I will give you like uh, five minutes to react, perhaps. Thank you very much. I won't need five minutes because these are all excellent questions. I'll have to digest them. Um, I'll try and answer them. So, Frederick, and actually, this is going to partly go to something I mentioned. I meant to mention in response to David Hummel. Has the Commission been selective in its approach? I mean, you look at the initial decisions that were taken against member states and it looks very clear it looks very much like there was a lack of trust in respect of some tax administrations so that looked like the initial motivation but then when you get to the final decisions that were issued we find something that's more akin to the um the commission being unhappy with particular techniques rather than particular member states so really focusing in upon the transactional net margin method as a method of transfer pricing that the Commission is not happy with, rather than it being about the motivation which underpinned the initial tax earnings. So that's why I say you know, I've got a lot more sympathy with the Commission when it came to those earlier investigations, or sorry, with the earlier decisions, the opening decisions, than I have with the Commission when it came to the final decisions, where the motivations which underpins those tax earnings are completely out the window and we're focusing upon what's the arm's length principle of, as it applies in different member states, whether particular techniques of transfer pricing are better than others and so on. I think that we've lost sight of the wood for the trees in that respect. So yes, initially, I think there was a lack of trust that underpins the investigations into certain member states, but I think it's just completely metamorphosed into something completely different. And uh, David, what I wanted to come back to actually was, I think that the, um, the courts are trying to figure out where this line is between state aid rules and domestic law. And my own, my own interpretation of the um, rulings from the general court have been that they have set in place an incredibly high threshold for the burden of proof as a means of making it incredibly difficult for the commission to take these cases. So I've got a different proposal as to how I think you could differentiate between the, the cases, but the general court has made it an evidence-based means of differentiation between those cases that should be an issue for EU law and those cases that shouldn't be an issue for EU law. Um, Federica, to come back to your question, I can only answer partly. Yes, the Code of Conduct for Business Taxation has, is being reformed. And yes, we have this uh, shift towards transparency. If I'm to give you my gut reaction, I think that what you said laterally was correct, that this is motivated partly by just the need to do something rather than a belief that the most recent transparency initiatives are actually going to help in terms of public understanding, in terms of holding tax authorities to account, and so on and so forth. So thank you very much, everybody, for your comments, for your questions. This has been really, really informative and I've got lots to think about and digest over the next couple of days. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you so much to Hans and David and all the questions. 
uh, we are waiting. Uh, we will have in our program at 1250. So in 20 minutes, we will have a Benjamin Angel, the direct, director and the director of direct taxation and tax coordination at the European Commission. He just finished a meeting of the platform for good tax governance. So hopefully he will be able to to move directly to us, but uh, since we have already two presentations, perhaps it's a nice time to have 10 minutes break. We come back at 12.40, so in nine minutes, 10 minutes. Then we have a kind of sum up of what has happened today. And then after we will give the word to Benjamin Angel. But it also will fit perfectly with this discussion on trust. Thank you so much. And I see you at 12.41, that is in 10 minutes time. work first to Eduardo Baistrocki, and then I will complement with some takeaways from this uh, morning session. And then after we will wait for Benjamin Angel. Um, and if Eduardo Traversa of Surajali would like to join also with some takeaways, please uh, feel free to intervene. Eduardo, I give the word to you for some takeaways of this morning session. Thank you very much, Irma. Uh, that's a very, very challenging invitation. I mean, what, what is the main takeaway from today's um, sessions? Oh, I will argue something probably unexpected. Uh, I think that all the papers presented today ground a theory of international taxation. So when we, what would we talk about when we talk about international taxation? And I think all papers are presumably grounding the following theory. Mm -hmm. Arguably, the international tax regime is fundamentally the result of the strategic interaction between three oligopolies. The first oligopoly is the oligopoly of multinational enterprises, such as Apple. The second oligopoly is the oligopoly of market jurisdiction, such as France and, and Germany. And the third oligopoly is the oligopoly of of tax hubs such as Ireland. What I can see based on the papers submitted today is that um, these three oligopolies have been having a veto power on all reform proposals submitted to the League of Nations first and then to, to the OECD. And, um, and I think that explains why the, the system has remained fundamentally the same since 1923. And going um, to, to the paper submitted by, by Stephen, arguably, I mean, his paper is, is dealing with the perennial issue of the strategic interaction between market jurisdictions and, and tax hubs using the European Union as a case study. So going to now to, to the paper submitted by, one may, may ask, where are developing countries in, in this strategic scenario of the three oligopolies? And my response to, to that question would be that developing countries are a very large group of, of countries that since uh, given its size, they are simply unable to coordinate. So my, my um, fundamental takeaway from today's papers is that we are fundamentally dealing uh, here with the the strategic interactions between three oligopolies, the oligopolies of multinational enterprises, market jurisdictions, and, and tax hubs. And because of the uh, last global financial crisis and now the current uh, pandemic, the bargaining power of, of market jurisdictions has somehow uh, expanded at the expense of the bargaining power of MNEs and, and tax hubs. And rationally, market jurisdictions are trying to somehow redistribute the rent from MEs to tax hubs in favor of market jurisdictions. So the big question that could we, we could offer an answer in the in our fourth global tax symposium next year is what can be done in order to to create a fourth oligopoly, the oligopoly of developing and, and emerging countries, and arguably some concepts taken from antitrust law could be useful. For example, the concept of clustering, how to um, induce developing countries to form smaller countries, small, smaller groups, in order to be, to be able to join the high table in Paris. So the big question I think is, is what can be done in order to create 
a fourth uh, oligopoly, ideally representing uh, the interest of de developing and emerging countries, in order to allow them to, to represent their interest in the high table of, of, uh, in, in Paris. So um, that's, I think, my main takeaway today. And uh, I'm looking forward to receiving your, your feedback on, on this theory of the three oligopolies. I'm looking forward to receiving your feedback, uh, Irma, if that is possible. Thank you so much. I see that the, the director, Benjamin Angel, has just joined us. I will give perhaps one minute to check uh, the, the sound. But I think that your, your final question, whether we have, what can be done to create a fourth oligopoly for developing countries, lower income countries, fits perfectly where the, in the place where we want to have the four global tax symposium, that is in India, and will be co-organized by Surajali Tandon. So without any further ado, I would just like to introduce uh, then uh, Director, General, Director General of the Directorate of Taxation, Direct Taxation, Tax Coordination, Economic Analysis and Evaluation of the European Commission. Director uh, Benjamin Angel, it is a pleasure to have you here. Normally, we started at 8.30 in the morning because it was New Zealand, Australian time. Now we are in kind of European time and some people in India already left. And tomorrow we will have a US uh, and Latin American time and European time. So thank you so much for being here. And we are looking forward to your closing remarks speech of today. Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on, on where you are. It's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you today. I've been asked to say a few words about uh, the action of the European Union to prepare the transposition of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. So let me uh, first stress the extreme importance that we attach to both pillars, actually. Uh, the uh, Pillar 2 is the one coming first in practice, uh, since the work is uh, more advanced. Uh, pillar 2 has been a difficult discussion within the European Union, uh, as we all know, uh, among the inclusive framework countries that were uh, expressing concerns uh, in the run-up to the October agreement, there were a certain EU member state. This difficulty comes primarily from the fact that uh, not everyone has the same starting point when uh, talking about Pillar 2. We had on the one hand, a group of member states which were seeing Pillar 2 as a prolongation of BEPS. And when you think that Pillar 2 is a prolongation of BEPS, BEPS is very much after the artificial arrangement. And you wonder why we should care about um, arrangements which do have economic substance. Uh, another group of member states, the bigger one, uh, was seeing Pillar 2 uh, rather as a way to set a floor on tax competition and have true minimum taxation set globally. Uh, that explain very much the uh, difficulties that we have had internally at the beginning. Some member states were uh, looking after um, substance carve out. And the whole discussion in the finishing line was about finding an appropriate uh, way to take into account their, their concerns. And this has been the case with the OECD agreement, which does foresee uh, a 10 year transition from uh, a relatively high level of substance carve out for those um, assets and, uh, sorry, tangible assets and uh, payroll down to a 5 person level uh, for those uh, in, in, in a non linear way. Where do we stand today as regards Pillar 2? Uh, the, working, the, the group, the work, sorry, in the OECD Working Party uh, has stopped. Uh, it was finalized uh, at the end of last week. Now, a written procedure has been launched with the inclusive framework number for members for its endorsement. We aim at putting the European Union in the forefront of the implementation of Pillar 2. And the Commission will table uh, a proposal of union legislation 
implementing Pillar 2 already before Christmas. Uh, with of December, uh, the legislative work will start almost immediately since uh, the new presidency of the council has announced its intention to all the meeting already on the 4th of January. Uh, the joint purpose or aim of the presidency and of the commission is to try to have it adopted by member state around April. It's a very challenging timeline, but if we want to respect the ambitious OECD timeline, which has been agreed on by 137 countries where uh, Pillar 2 is supposed to start in 2023, speed is clearly of the essence. Our transposition uh, will not be an exercise of creativity. Uh, we have not foreseen uh, gold plating. We will stick uh, closely to the model rules, but just translate them into uh, union legislation using union terminology. The only area where uh, we have to uh, introduce very clearly uh, a strong nuance in our approach is that uh, in union legislation, it would be uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible, to have rules whereby uh, uh, a foreign uh, subsidiary would be taxed more than a domestic one. So we uh, de facto will cover also domestic subsidiary uh, under Pillar 2. And we are still looking into the question uh, on whether, from a legal point of view, uh, we need to cover also uh, groups, which would be the proof 750 million euro, uh, and purely domestic. Uh, the, the assessment is still ongoing by our legal service. We need to uh, assess it against the background of the extensive jurisprudence that we have in the, from the European Court of Justice on the implementation of freedom of establishment. Difficult question, uh, but the answer will come soon. Uh, you hear and read a lot of assessment on what should be the, the, the impact of Pillar 2 on countries and how much it should generate, and who are the winner, who are the losers. I would advise that you take all figures that you can see with a serious pinch of salt. Uh, there is a lot of unknown in Pillar 2, not as regards rule, but as regards the effect of the rule, for instance, will the country which today have a very low tax, will they increase very quickly uh, their level of taxation or not? You have to keep in mind uh, that Pillar 2 applies only to companies having more than 750 million euro uh, turnover. So you have also uh, plenty of companies which are not in scope, not to mention. Uh, natural persons. Second question, will companies which are located in those jurisdictions change of location because of a possible change in the tax policy in said jurisdiction? We just don't know, actually. That's too much unknown at this stage to take any firm decision. If, if you take the example of a member state which is clearly impacted as a good illustration of the uh, uncertainty. If you look at Ireland, is anyone able really to say whether the two will really have an impact on the attractiveness of Ireland? Because for companies in scope, the rate would move from 12 and a half to 15 percent, while it would stay at 12 and a half for other companies. This is a very difficult question that no one can answer because irrespective of the tax rate, Ireland is a very dynamic economy with a well-trained workforce, flexible labor market, use of English. So it has plenty of natural advantages other than taxation. I use it as an illustration just to uh, pass you the message to be cautious with all the figures you, you see. Uh, since uh, it's very much a blank page. And so most of the facts that we have this veil of uncertainty has helped 
in the negotiation, because in any international negotiation, if you have a clear identification of who are the winners and who are the losers, the uh, likelihood that you get the losers on board is relatively limited. Here we don't know, we are setting a new uh, global rule uh, and we will see how countries and companies will adjust to this new environment. Uh, we think it is useful to have uh, this uh, floor to tax competition and useful in particular for the small countries. If you're the United States, if you're United Kingdom, if you're Germany, if you're France, you can afford having a relatively uh, high corporate income tax and uh, yet still be attractive for investors despite this high corporate income tax. If you're a small exotic island somewhere uh, in the middle of the Atlantic uh, and have a relatively uh, already moderate corporate income tax at 10% and your neighbor is moving at 0%, you are under very significant pressure to align. So this race to the bottom, which existed on small country, with de facto uh, be very strongly limited thanks to Pillar 2, and that is obviously uh, a major breakthrough we should be uh, very happy with. Moving now to pillar one. Pillar one is an animal which has changed a lot uh, over the last year. Very clearly, uh, many countries around the world originally were interested by pillar one as a way to address the difficulties that we all know in taxing the uh, digital sector. The digital sector is the only sector for which you can have a very, very strong mismatch uh, between the way we ordinarily uh, implement taxation, which is based on physical presence, and the way this sector operates, since from any country in the world, you can virtually save the whole planet and not pay any tax in the other countries where you do make a substantial uh, profit. So in that sense, uh, it was important to have an initiative addressing it. Under uh, the uh, influence of the uh, Biden-Harris administration, uh, the year, the scope has been very significantly widened. Now we cover uh, all companies, uh, irrespective of the sector, which have uh, profitability threshold above 10 person and uh, a turnover above uh, 20 billion, with the exception only of the financial sector and extractive industry. So that's a different animal. It doesn't mean that the digital sector is out of the game because when you try to assess which companies are in scope, you come to the conclusion that actually the big names are there. So if you're looking for uh, Microsoft, Apple, uh, Alphabet, uh, Meta, et cetera, Tencent, Alibaba, they're in. So in that sense, uh, even though numeric Play the digital company to represent uh, a small share of the companies in scope, maybe six, seven percent. Uh, they do represent a, a significant share of the taxable base that would be a portion between participating countries. So, Pillar One is de facto answering the concerns that uh, many countries in Europe, in particular, had with the taxation of the digital sector. But it's also introducing a, a very innovative way of handling the uh, taxation globally of large multinationals. The level of granularity of the work in the OECD on Pillar 1 is far less advanced at the moment than on Pillar 2. They are still uh, despite the, the, the broad political agreement, which has been reached a number of uh, important issues that needs to be agreed on, in particular, how to tackle double, on, uh, double taxation, sorry, which is uh, obviously an essential issue. In terms of timing, we hope to uh, have a draft multilateral convention on the table in spring uh, for signature in June. We don't know yet how granular the multilateral convention will be. And we'll assess once we know uh, the content of the multilateral convention, 
what is needed in union law. The Commission has announced that it will table a directive also for Pillar 1. Uh, but whether it is uh, uh, a rather limited directive or, or a very extensive one, uh, whether we need to amend some pieces of union legislation or not, is uh, very much a no at this stage. Uh, we intend, like we're doing for Pillar 2, to be very quick. And in that respect, we uh, will endeavor to table uh, a transposition of Pillar 1 as soon as possible. So basically, if we have the multilateral convention in June, uh, we will try to uh, put something on the table, probably in July or August, if we manage. The calendar for Pillar 1 is even more challenging than for Pillar 2. Because in both cases, the official OECD calendar does mention 2023, uh, with a big difference that uh, rules now are uh, known, uh, at least to the member state, even though they have not been made public for Pillar 2, while there is still a lot to discuss for Pillar 1. So by definition, it is extremely tight. Uh, the official OECD calendar does mention uh, ratification process of only six months uh, for the second half of 2022. Uh, this is certainly uh, far quicker uh, than what has been experienced in the past, not only for the BEPS convention. Uh, even today, some of the EU member states have not completely finalized their ratification five years after. So it will take uh, a collective effort uh, to uh, get there very quickly. We know also uh, that uh, ratification in some key players uh, will be challenging politically. Uh, this is not a surprise, uh, but all the 137 participants have taken a firm commitment, and we hope that they will deliver uh, on uh, this commitment. There are discussions at the moment on how it should enter into force. I would expect personally uh, that this would probably work not as uh, an ordinary convention under international law, uh, where uh, you just ask for a critical mass of countries to uh, endorse it numerically, because here the number matters, but that is not the exclusive element that we have to take into account. We have to be sure also that among those that have been ratified, we have also the, the big players, which are the countries having a substantial share of the taxable base to be apportioned. If we had all the small fishes and not the big player, obviously the Pillar 1 agreement would not make much sense. And that will have to be encaptured from a legal point of view with uh, a dedicated uh, mechanisms to ensure that we have not a single set of conditions that is not only the number of country, uh, but also other element integrated in the formula for the entry into force. Mm -hmm. I will not enter into more detail because this is uh, obviously still uh, being discussed and we need to uh, get consensus among all uh, members. So all in all, uh, for Pillar 2, uh, we're almost there and we will uh, table very soon the uh, measures which are needed. We are confident that we will get in the European Union the unanimity uh, that we need, since the heavy lifting has been done already. And for Pillar 1, uh, we will do our utmost to be quick, uh, and we will contribute uh, to the best of our possibilities to finalizing the ongoing uh, OECD discussion. We care for both Pillar, but the fact is that Pillar 2 is technically more advanced and we see no reason uh, to wait uh, and to drag on the implementation of Pillar 2 because some further work is needed on Pillar 1. And I stop there and be happy to take any questions uh, if you wish. Thank you so much. I just ask in the chat, if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and I can take them here or please raise your hand. I do have a, one question already, and that's one question that I may have and seen that you already 
have this morning the discussion in the platform of good tax governance, I was wondering whether in the same way with the standard of good tax governance, where it was included the BEPS uh, as one of the criteria in this standard of good tax governance, whether it's also being considered now the pillar two and the minimum tax as one of the criteria for a good tax governance. And I was wondering whether there is uh, some views uh, of, at this stage on that. Well, there is no decision because clearly uh, this discussion still have to take place uh, within the member states, with the member state and, and also within the commission. But I guess your question is referring to the action of the code of conduct and on whether uh, we would put uh, as part of the criteria for assessing uh, whether uh, a country in scope should be or not on the list of non-cooperative tax jurisdiction, uh, whether we will have a, a criterion about joining PLA2. Speaking on a personal capacity, uh, because this has not been discussed officially yet, so speaking only on a personal capacity, I would think it makes sense. And that would be in line with the practice we have followed so far, where uh, we have made joining BEPS a criteria, joining the Global Forum a criteria, joining MAC a criteria. So we have always used so far the list of non cooperative tax jurisdiction, not as a way to export aggressively our rules, but as a way to Support aggressively the international tax good practices. And obviously, uh, against such a background, Pillar 2 is a major breakthrough in building uh, a more robust set of international tax good practices. But we have to do one step at a time. Uh, normally, we never ask other countries things that we do not impose to ourselves. I think it's a sound principle. So the first thing that we have to do is obviously uh, have the directives that will be table adopted. And once this directive is adopted, and I can safely uh, conclude uh, that all member states will soon implement the two, uh, then uh, we can start uh, discussing uh, whether to uh, include it as part of the parameter ask. Uh, a little bit more forcefully to third countries. Thank you so much. Uh, I will give the word now to Professor Ana Paula Dorado. Uh, Professor, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you also, Mr. Benjamin Angel. Uh, I would have a question. I'm, I'm not sure whether you can answer it, uh, but I, I wonder what will be the role of the UTPR in the EU uh, if uh, we are guessing that there will be a binding income inclusion rule. So will the UTPR uh, be optional or will it play any role at all? Thank you. It's a good question, but I can answer it actually because the answer is, uh, is pretty clear in our mind. Uh, uh, the UTPR, de facto, once we have the directive, will be an instrument used only uh, between member states and third countries. Uh, it will not be needed within the European Union since everyone will implement the income inclusion rule. Uh, the way to implement the income inclusion rule uh, has evolved in the model rules, and you may uh, have learned that there is now an option to have the uh, top up implemented at the level of the constituent entity country, which is different from what was envisaged so far. Uh, our directive will mirror the existence of this option, and I would expect, obviously, all uh, low tax jurisdiction to make use of the option because it's clearly in their interest. So uh, basically, uh, UTPR not use, income inclusion rule, they are de facto in the model rules as they stand three different modalities for implementing it for countries which would have a tax rate below 15%. The first one is just to increase across the board the CIT rate, it's a possibility. The second possibility is to do what Ireland has announced, 
that is to have a different corporate income tax for the companies in scope where they will have 15% and then the one applied for the companies which are not in scope where Ireland has announced its intention to retain its 12 and a half. And uh, this has been announced after discussion by the commission where Ireland has checked that this was not uh, creating potential issues under our competition law and it got assurances from the commission that it does not. And the third possibility is not moving the, uh, not moving the uh, tax rate at all, but just applying a top up if and where needed on a company per company basis. As far as the commission is concerned, we are agnostic for member states to uh, decide uh, how they want to do it. Uh, as Deng Xiaoping used to say, uh, no matter, it doesn't matter whether the, the cat is black or white, as long as it catches the mice, uh, here uh, the effect would be reach, which is ensuring that there is minimum effective taxation for the companies in scope uh, under any of those three possibilities. Uh, we will see in practice who does what. Thank you so much. I have three questions and uh, let's see how we can deal. I think the first one is with the chat because it's Anne Dogutu. She's professor uh, in uh, South Africa and she also is member of the UN Faculty Panel, has been working a lot on BEPS. And the, her question is, implementing Pillar 2 is optional. Will the AU impose trade sanctions on countries that do not implement Pillar 2? Trade sanctions, certainly not. Uh... That is uh, completely uh, excluded, and uh, we uh, we are firmly attached to WTO principle, and there's nothing in the WTO that would allow us to impose trade sanction on uh, countries not implementing Pillar Two. So the question is not the one of trade sanction, but rather the one you you raise yourself, Yamar, uh, which is whether in the future we would make it a criteria when assessing whether a country is cooperative uh, from a tax point of view or not. This is still an important question because as you may know, uh, the effect of being uh, put uh, on the Annex 1 of this list, that is a so-called blacklist, are becoming very substantial. Uh, and they are becoming uh, even more substantial in 2021, since all member states uh, have implemented their uh, commitment to introduce defensive measures. Uh, so now, for instance, we have a dozen of member states which have introduced a resulting tax. We have 16 member states which introduce a non-deductibility of interest, et cetera. And resulting tax on time at level which are very significant. To give you just one example, in Denmark, for instance, you have a whistling tax of 44% on all dividend payment towards blacklisted jurisdiction. So that, that would be the tool if a decision is taken to use it. Uh, but as I said, we have to go one step at a time. First, we have to adopt the directive on the two to make sure that uh, the uh, union is walking the talk. I'm not that I'm particularly worried, I'm convinced that it will. Uh, and then uh, discuss whether uh, we uh, ask third country to take a similar commitment. Thank you so much. I will just put the two questions together from Federica and Sebastian, and that will be the two final questions. Hopefully you are still okay on time. Sure. Okay. Please, Federica, and then after Sebastian, and then uh, the, the, the Director Benjamin Angel will res, respond to answer the question. Please, Federica. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity. So my question also refers to the European tax, uh, tax seven list. And um, the question is, how would you explain the necessity to still have a tax seven list, particularly for the European Union, and particularly with reference to the fair taxation criteria? Um, in a new world where minimum tax uh, will apply, uh, so where uh, Pillar 2 will be implemented. 
Um, please go ahead. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was very enlightening. Um, I just have a quick question. Um, so it, it seems that one of one of the important drivers of uh, the very fast negotiation of Pillar Two was um, the Biden administration. Um, and, and, and on that regard, I was wondering to what extent do you think um, uh, an, an agreement on Pillar Two could be vulnerable to um, changes in political circumstances on the big players, a change of government in the US or a change of political thinking in, in other of the big players, let's say China? Um, and how could you make uh, such an agreement um, less vulnerable to, to, to those changes. Thank you. Thank you for so, the questions. Please go ahead. So I start with the question of uh, Federica. Um, Pillar 2 is obviously a major breakthrough, um, but it would be exaggerated to say that it completely uh, end any possibility of uh, tax misbehavior from uh, some jurisdiction if only uh, because of its uh, threshold, it applies only to companies having a turnover above 750 million. You could very well have some jurisdictions that would specialize in uh, mid caps, so companies which would have a turnover below, or uh, in attracting uh, rich individuals trying to evade taxation. So for this reason, the two is an extremely important development, but it doesn't mean uh, we need to uh, stop watch, uh, watching for other risk or other mispractices. And uh, that is certainly not our intention. In any case, we will uh, keep on uh, monitoring this very closely. And as far as the European Union is concerned, we even plan to introduce uh, new legislation uh, in a number of fields which are related to the fight against tax avoidance and tax evasion. For instance, we will table at, at the end of December also legislation on shell companies, uh, which is uh, this time not, not linked at all to OECD discussion, which will be uh, our own. Sorry, that's my issue with my chair. Uh, we uh, will also make new legislation on uh, tax transparency, and we will work on introducing new criteria in the code of conduct, such as uh, beneficial ownership criteria, uh, automatic exchange of information criteria, and paying more attention to the effectiveness of the implementation, because our approach today is too legalistic. It's a bit uh, too much to tick the box. It is a country as a flow of legislation. We ask the country to change its legislation and in that sense. Uh, the Code of Conduct has worked remarkably well. Uh, we have obtained since 2017 more than uh, 140 changes in foreign legislation in 60 countries. We didn't expect to have such results when we launched it, to be honest. So it's been working. Uh, but we have to make sure, and that's a clear uh, conclusion also of what we have learned from the Pandora Papers, that the jurisdiction that commit to introduce, for instance, economic substance requirement implemented and check that there is economic substance. And now we still have some more work to do, uh, to be honest. Uh, Sebastian, um, I'm getting old and I have Alzheimer's. Could you please just remind me what was your question? Because I don't have any paper with me and I did not take note of it. No problem, uh, very quick. Um, so uh, I was wondering that um, it seems that one of the main drivers of the very fast and successful negotiation of Pillar 2 um, was the Biden administration. Um, okay. uh, so where are we with uh, Pillar 2 uh, going forward in case of change of government? Okay. Uh, this is a Biden Harris administration has been very useful uh, to unlock the whole package. But the support to Pillar 2 existed already in the Trump administration. So where uh, the Biden-Harris administration made the difference was it for Pillar 1. Uh, there is for Pillar 2 some bipartisan support in the United States. Uh, you have to keep in mind um, that the first country to introduce uh, minimum taxation requirement 
actually has been the United States under the Trump administration is guilty and, and beat. Uh, what the current administration is doing is improving what was done under the previous administration, uh, notably by moving from a global blending to a jurisdictional blending, which uh, bring de facto uh, guilty and globe much, much, much closer and in effect relatively equivalent. Uh, but the, the work started under a Republican administration. So in that sense, uh, there is no intellectual opposition to uh, the direction uh, that is being uh, taken uh, by, by the Republican. So uh, we obviously have to wait for the adoption of guilty, which I understand uh, hopefully might take place before the end of the year. Uh, the OECD will put on paper some principles of the equivalence between globe and guilty, uh, but from what we can read and hear today, uh, I don't think there is a particular source of concern. You have also to keep in mind that there is a fundamental difference between pillar one and pillar two. For pillar one, we need, the key, we need everyone on board, basically. We need the key players on board. And no one could imagine, for instance, that the European Union would implement Pillar 1 if the uh, United States, for instance, or, uh, or any other large trade partner you can think of uh, would uh, have decided at the end not to implement it. So clearly, we need all key players on board because the very uh, functioning of uh, an apportionment formula <laughs> Uh, does involve uh, uh, this large participation. Pillar two, in essence, is, is not international law. It's a common approach, and it is just uh, calling for uh, some kind of harmonization of unilateral measures. So in that sense, uh, a hiccup here and there on pillar two, I'm not talking the US because I don't expect any hiccup in the US, but the hiccup here and there on pillar two, would not produce the same effect as an ECAP for Pillar 1. Nothing would prevent us to do it, even if uh, some countries would have had difficulties domestically to uh, put it in practice. Thank you so much. I know your time is limited, so thank you so much for being here. You have already gave us a lot of food for thought also in this discussion. and. Uh, we started this morning, when we started, we discussed it about the consensus and then after we moved towards the uh, transformation of uh, tax administrations and we have gone to the pillar two, um, the trust and tax administration and now we've finished with the discussion on the EU and the, and the work on the pillar one and pillar two. So thank you so much because this is a perfect way to end today. Uh, we will have, we will start tomorrow since we are starting with the US and Latin America. We will start at 2.30 uh, uh, Dutch time, and then we will start with Latin American tax system, whether it's a failure. And an interesting question, perhaps, this will be also available on video recording, so you can perhaps after, a question by Vincent Aaron Bundek uh, with a question about who should tax multinationals, a political scientist from Canada. So thank you so much, uh, uh, the, Mr. Angel, and thank you for being here, and thank you everyone for staying and since very early in the morning until to right now and uh, i see you then uh, tomorrow thank you so much thank you bye